The podcast on Haunted Hill will contain spoilers and swearing. I am the devil, and I am here to do the devil's work. I saw this light go. Be one of us. I didn't tell you my name. Hang up. I didn't tell them my name. Hello and welcome to the podcast on Haunted Hill, episode 154. 154. Um, my name is Gav from the planet Uranus. Wow, my name is Dan from the Jupiter moon of something. Do you know Uranus is actually the smelliest of the uh, planets? And it's not called Uranus. U- 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 Uranus? Is that? Uranus is pronounced. Uh, it's a, it has the most, the, uh, most smelly gas of any um, of the planets. And Pluto is no longer a planet, sadly. Got and, demoted. And did you know that they wanted to actually give a, a, the moon a, a actual time zone? Really? Yeah, that was word. Mm, word. Yeah, word. I also found out that the Brachiosaurus has now been debunked. It's not an actual dinosaur. It was a combination of skeletons. And it's no such thing as a... Or was it a Brontosaurus? One of the two. It's no longer a dinosaur. So, well, there we go. Oh, Enough that's that. the interesting podcast. Uh, listeners... You're not here for that. You're here for Dolph Lundgren and Dan Bone birthday nurse, aren't you? It's a birthday <laughs> episode. It's my birthday, and I'll cry if I want. Talking of dinosaurs, and I'll cry if I want to. <laughs> uh, yeah, a double Dolph Lundgren. D, yes, D, yes. D. Yes, welcome everybody, 154. For those not uh, savvy with how we do things, when it's one of the guests, when it's one of the hosts, not the guests, one of the hosts' birthdays, um, then that person gets to pick the movies. Yeah. Uh, so I've, as Gav said, I've selected uh, a couple of Dolph Lundgren movies, basically an excuse to talk about He-Man, because mm-hmm. I'm a big He-Man fan. Yeah. So as you may have guessed, one of those movies is the canon classic, 1987 it- one. I was going to say, it's not always nice to see the old Canon logo. It's always lovely to see. Um, Canon Classic, 1987, Dolph Lundgren, Courtney Cox starring Masters of the Universe. Uh, and a lot to talk about with that one and uh, Canon Studios and what it did to Canon Studios and the toy line and all that business and Dolph Lundgren's career, blah, 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 blah. And the other one is a lesser known but often mentioned as one of his best sort of solo movies and that's 1990s Dark Angel also known in the US as I Come in Peace um, yeah. which is uh, a sci-fi slight horror that's more sci-fi dark cop or it's not kind of like Highlander meets um, Lethal Weapon it's just weird and wonderful and Gav I don't think you'd seen it before so I'm excited to no. hear your thoughts on that yep so that's what we're going to be covering. And obviously, Bill Murray is already... He's been here for about three hours because, uh, you know, it's my birthday. So he's been baking me a birthday cake, birthday brownies, which I'm refusing to eat because God knows what he's putting in them. Uh, but he's it's, excited. You, you'd hope it's, it's weed. It's not. It's probably something really weird. It's crack. probably like crack, yeah. Yeah. Um, he's, well, he's dressed as Walter White. Bill so. Murray and his crack brownies. Yeah, he is dressed as Walter White, so... That actually that makes sense now. But yeah, he'll be here to lead us into the world of the strange later on. And we're just gonna have a lot of fun since it's my birthday and talk about weird and wonderful things. So there'll be some sharks in a moment to talk about, shark movies, and uh, he lots of He Man and Action Heroes, Dolph Lundgren and all that kind of good it's, stuff. It is strange that for this whole whole time we've been podcasting over ten years that we 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 have a third member. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I said the humorous name for a penis. Member. Member. Uh we have a third member. Um, uh, and it's it's Bill Murray, but he's never he's, he's never ever been there. Oh, cat out of the bag! Don't ruin it. It's not ruined it at all. That's like saying Nicholas Cage isn't officially our mascot because he's Christmas officially our mascot. Real, what the fuck? This I is said, my birthday. It's episode. like saying that. I didn't say oh, it's okay. actual facts. I don't know enough about that. Ooh, um, but ooh. but yeah, we have a third member of being Bill Murray, which I love that after over ten years. Oh, Bill. I know. Yeah. I know. Well, I have to get him to speak one day. Maybe, maybe. I mean, just getting him 
on the air. Yeah. Here's he's, a, here's he's a, saying no. He's here's a furry no thing me. for your mouth. He's nodding no to me as we. Uh, it's a microphone. It's not allowed. You know the contract isn't allowed. He's not. I know. Yep. He says no. You know. I know the contract allows him to only literally introduce World of the Strange, and it's certainly not. You know, a sound bite from a movie that he was in many years ago. Well, I tell you what, Bill. We've actually had word from Dolph Lundgren, and he's actually said. You know, if we ever thought of replacing you, that uh, um, he would step in. Oh. Sorry. Who would win in a fight between Dolph Lundgren and Bill Murray? <laughs> um, I don't know. Bill Murray might know something we don't. Yeah, to be fair, Bill Murray is a golf very club. mysterious man. He might have golf club ninja skills. Yeah. Indeed, indeed. Well, it's my birthday. I know you're dying to know what I did for my birthday. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did you say for your birthday? <laughs> you're right. <laughs> if you had one of those brownies. No. Um, it was a very low-key one. The children were in preschool, so my wife drove me out to the country. This sounds like the start of a horror film. Uh, and treated me to a country pub dinner. Sound like a porn movie, actually. Oh, and the car broke down. Took me out to the country and blew me in the bushes. Bloody hell. No, that didn't happen. We just literally went out, had some lunch, um, and then drove back to Bristol and uh, had to pick the kids up. But it was very low-key, very nice <coughs> birthday. Um, so that was that, really. Nothing special, but... No, hand job hamps lo- and hamp- hampers. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I don't know what a hand job, ha- hand job hamper is. But... It makes me think a hamper think makes me think a basket case. So I certainly don't want a hand job from that thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's a hard sell. Hard indeed. Uh, but I have been watching lots of films, Gav. What have you been watching? Oh shit! Where's my phone? Let me get me your IMDb and also I'm actually oh, last time I was on it. I had my notes and everything. Jesus Christ! <sighs> you carry on. All right. Well, I'm I'm going to disappoint you straight away. Oh, good. Why? Because I, you know, I love shark movies. Yeah. 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 I finally rewatched the Meg. Oh, I, I like Meg though. Do you not? Like I know. It? I know you do. That's why I'm going to disappoint you. Oh, that's you fine. gave. I watched it. Didn't like it. You gave me the DVD, and I thought, oh, I'll rewatch this now because I still haven't seen the sequel. Hated it. I don't know why. Because everyone else seems to get on with it and really enjoy it but I found it really boring um, no and it, I, I there's not everyone I know if people I've seen people don't like it even though it, it's got a sense of fun to it mm. I didn't really find it fun um, and I, I don't I, if you put Jason Statham in a shark movie surely that's got a damn bone yeah, written all over it because that, those two components work for me I'm quite happy just put a Jason Statham movie on and if it's a shark movie you know and the kids like it so it's one to put on in the background with the kids there, sort of thing. I'm just a bit sad. It's one of those ones that I'm a bit sad I don't get it. I don't get the hype. But I'm still going to check out the Meg 2, um, which I think you've seen. Um, but, yeah, so I had to um, sort of medicate myself there by watching another shark movie. So after that, I watched Mega Shark versus Colossus. Of course you did. And uh, how did that go? I enjoyed it about as much as the Meg. Oh, good. Um, Have you seen the Meg too? No, that's what I just said to you. I haven't seen oh, it Oh, sorry, I wasn't listening to you. That's, all right. <clears> that's why this it. podcast works so well. Um, but the Me- Mega Shark vs. Colossus is the fourth film in the Mega Shark series. Uh, and wow. Let me, wow. Just, let, let me just read you the synopsis. Yeah. In search of a new energy source, Russia accidentally awakens the Colossus, which is a giant robot from the Cold War. Just oh, as they do, right. just as they do this, a new mega shark appears. Fucking coincidence! Coincidence! Winky dinky, right there. Fucking hell! So they've made this gone and made this big giant robot shark uh, uh, to help help with with war. Yeah. It's not a robot shark. It's a robot. It's a humanoid robot. So it's a giant robot man that <laughs> fights the shark. But he, he was frozen. Why was he frozen? During the Cold War. What is he like a massive cyborg? Yeah. Not with like a fin or something. Yeah. No. He's, no. 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 He's, he's just 
It's Mega Shark versus Colossus. But so why is he? In, what, but he could survive frozen under the water for so many yeah, years. Yeah, because yeah, he's a robot. Right. But did they not think of getting him out before? Did they not? I don't know. Well, they they, they forget. They, they must have they, got him. So they well, accidentally they thought, got him out. Yeah, they filled him out. But uh, uh, Kowinky Dink is a, is a giant fucking shark. Well, the thing is, this is the fourth in the series. So right. if you've been keeping up with the series, which I know you and a lot of our listeners have, I feel like I need to. Um, there's a now by this fourth film. There's a crew of women with giant boobs in scantily clad clothing who right. ride around in these cool submarines, taking out megalodons because the mega shark is is one of many mega sharks. Right. Uh, so while they're doing that, they realise, oh no, there's another megalodon. Mm. Let's, where is he? He's Russia. All right, let's go there. Oh no, the big robot's woken up. What do you think is going to happen? They're going to have a big punch up. Yeah. Bob's, Bob's your uncle, Fanny's your aunt. Dan's happy. No Jason Statham in it. You know that, that. I'm sad about that, but who won? <laughs> the audience. <laughs> yeah, I think they did. Yeah. You won. That's who won. I won. I won. A, you won with a fucking knockout. Yeah. I watched so, yeah, oh, I did watch, watch a couple of bits and bobs. Uh I'll tell you what, I watched a movie called Surviving the Game with Ice T. Yes, you did. <laughs> Fucking hell, that poster was atrocious. Oh yeah, yeah. That that poster shows Ice T running. It doesn't even it, look it, like Ice T. He's not even really running, he's kind of just a pat pattern along through the da, 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 da. Um, and that's pretty much his running in the movie. But this I movie I've never heard of it Sarah and I watched it I said I just found this movie I was like, should we watch it I was like, I was like it's fucking um, Gary Boosie basically hunting iced tea and she's like sold and I was like okay let's do it so we rented it out on Amazon um, if Rutger somebody ha- else was Rutger in it Howell, they? who Rutger was the Howell. other one? oh Rutger Howell. fucking hell what a, well, I mean that's that those three names in a movie sounds great it looked like Hard Target from the poster I think I've got Airbnb people again. There's always bloody people there. I can hear young kids screaming. Anyway. Um, it looked like Hard Target from the poster and from the bits you sent me. Um, the, the Van Damme movie. Yeah. It, yeah. Uh, yeah. A little bit like that. Um, it's, it was a 90s film. Um, and the thing was, it should have been really, really, really good. But I can't spoil it. But um, some characters shouldn't... What happened to them so early shouldn't have happened. Hmm. Uh, and it kind of like went, uh, it started off like really promising and then kind of just went downhill a little. Yeah, I love when you discover these movies, like the one the time you discovered that one about Nick Nolte secretly living in someone's attic. Hiding in the attic or hiding in the house. Of all the people you want to find up there, you don't want Nick Arr, Nolte up there. Gary Boosie. Uh, oh, no, was it Gary or was it Nick? Nick Nolte. Who was Ga- it hiding in the attic? Gary Boosie. It's always Gary, okay. Gary, Gary Boosie. Yeah. Jesus Christ, that's even worse. But yeah, and Gary Boosie chose after you. Uh, and he has a punch up voice too. Um, but anyway, worth a watch. I can hear if you, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, non gendered people, aliens, uh, dinosaurs, ET, ghosts, ghouls, goblins, and ghouls. Um, uh, if you hear anything next door, I can't do fuck all about it, so you have to put out of it. We can't hear it, Gav. Don't worry. Cool. <laughs> but, so, would you recommend uh, surviving the game? Uh, if you're my age, or if you are going down the rabbit hole of, I want to check out kind of B-flick, non ease action films with people I know in who are not A, a starers but B starers kind of thing yeah yeah you may as well check it out there's no reason not to check it out because that's the thing now it's really funny things like Cliffhanger I watched recently for the first time there's a few other movies like that I'm discovering first time because when they came out we had a gluttony of of different films we could watch. We had a pick of like some incredible like Schwarzenegger Predator and do you know what I mean? We had some you, good big you, movies. So some of the other movies just kind of got missed out because it wasn't generally... streaming. We didn't have access to it. But that's why you checked out. So you generally went for the person's name. You know, this leads into yeah. the theme of the episode, which is Dolph Lundgren, uh, you know, and action heroes. Uh, and I can actually follow up what you what you've seen with. I watched a. Um, uh, marked for death with Steven Seagal where he takes on the Jamaican drug lords yeah which is, is right it's, an <laughs> film. it's yeah. his most violent film that's for sure loads of beheadings and stuff and I watched the uncut version which apparently wasn't released for years it's really violent um, but 
again, you went when you woke, when you walked in the video store, you went for the name, didn't you? you, you yeah, you yeah, did, yeah. The, which is why you might have missed some of these movies. Although it's weird that you missed Cliffhanger, I guess, because it's like yeah. But I was just like, why do I want to see Sylvester Stallone, late nonnies, whatever, climbing up a, a mountain? I don't really care. At that point, I'm probably you know watching other films or whatever, you know. So. Yeah. Um, but then now. With like Amazon, you just go, what's that? And that leads on to another thing. Then you go, what's uh, other viewers watch this or whatever? And you go down to the list underneath and you start going through that and you're like, fucking hell, what the fuck's this shit? Which was that? <laughs> and that so, time me, me and my dad discovered Dark Angel, which we'll get on to when we so cover it. I, I have to give props to Amazon Prime. I think, I think as a video service, they are the closest you got to a fucking video shop. Uh, yeah. the, uh, with with random things you find, so um, I, I, you know, I I think Amazon Prime is pretty good in that sense for video films. Weird, you're weird. What else you been doing then? Uh, I also watched um, Top Gun Maverick, the sequel to Top Gun, which came out in uh, 2022. I've j- only just got around to it. I was never a huge Top Gun fan. It's all right. Yeah, I certainly watched it a I bunch of it, times, but I saw it first time a couple of years. But no, it's about four or five years ago now, and uh, I, I, I was. Unimpressed. I don't care about movies or airplanes flying around. I like but, movies inside airplanes, though, where some shit's going down, terrorists or something like that. Outside, yeah. I ain't bothered. Well, Top Gun Maverick, um, and one might argue, Gab, that they aren't about people flying planes. They're about I'm sure, the they're, themselves. Not. I'm sure um, they're not. I'm sure they But Top Gun Maverick is, in my opinion, better than Top Gun um, because it's kind of play. It plays on that old grizzled. You know, the character that you remember from the 80s comes back and they're a little bit sort of older and life hasn't really moved on for them and then they get involved in something. Kind of like the Expendables, kind of like these late sequels we're seeing a lot of recently, you know, Ghostbusters Afterlife, Bill and Ted's third one or whatever that was called. Piece of shit that it was. Um, Matrix 10 or whatever that new one. You're getting these late sequels, but this was good and um, it was just a story, a simple story, but the last 45 minutes I was on the edge of my seat because I didn't know I hadn't read up on any I didn't know who may or may not die in it you know no spoilers and you're not going to get any from me it's still only a year or so old but really 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 good it's on Netflix UK and like I said I think I prefer it to the first one um great soundtrack great acting Tom Cruise was great in it I don't, you know, I can take all of Tom Cruise, but he's very good in uh, Top Gun Maverick. So, yeah, Tom Cruise is a strange character. He is, uh, he's like Spielberg. He's meant to be in films and but make films. Spielberg was meant to make films. Uh, Tom Cruise was made to make to act in films. Uh, it's a shame that he believes Scientology is, is obviously helping fuel that. And it's like you could do this yourself. I think you've got it in you. Don't worry. Funny you say that, Top Gun Maverick is what made Steven Spielberg and Tom Cruise friends again because they, they fell out after making War of the Worlds. Um, okay. They had a huge falling out. It's never really been fully disclosed. Creative but, con- uh, differences, probably. Well, Tom Cruise was the one that got Spielberg to make because obviously Tom Cruise was in um, the um, Minority Report, Spielberg yeah. movie. Yeah. They in- really enjoyed working together because they work. They have the same work ethic. They work, 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 that's, work. That's why I said both those guys, um, yeah. On the set of Minority Report, Tom Cruise came to him and said, I've got three scripts that I've been given. I want you to help me with these. Which one of these do you think we should make? And one of them was War of the Worlds. And Spielberg was like, well, I loved this as a kid. And Tom was like, that's the one that I want you to... I'm glad you said that, because that's the re- one I'm really looking at the most. Uh, Let's make this together. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So they, they made that together, really enjoyed the experience working together. But then not long after that, they all fell out. It's never oh, really afterwards. been... Afterwards? Really, yeah. But on when I what that would be about. But when Top Gun Maverick came out, um, Spielberg said to Tom Cruise, "You've single-handedly saved cinema because people aren't going to the cinema because of COVID." But your movie, because it came out just as COVID was kind of winding down, and you could start going back to the cinema. He said, "Your movie's going to make more people want to go back into the cinema." So you're you're almost single-handedly regenerating yeah. cinema re- revenue, yeah. and they're friends again now. So yeah. Um, yeah, they're both exactly the same type of people, definitely. Yeah. I, I, this is, with Tom Cruise, though, he's, he's a strange character. He's, he's the sort of person where you think you're, you're a little bit disillusioned in some ways, but you are, like, hands down, you're the hardest working man in show business next to James Brown. Rest, rest in peace. Um, so, <laughs> can a drummer have some? Poor drummer. Drummer never got some. 
John Madden's had some in a long time. Anyway, Tom Cruise. I expect Tom Cruise has had some. Don't know. Might not have done. Who knows? Right. Uh, well, I Tom suppose Cruise. I should tell you about something else I've watched then. Please do. I, che- I checked out that Eight for Silver came on a... It's called Curse as well. A werewolf yeah, flick. I don't know why it's saw, got two names. I saw that Just keep uh, a couple of years back because I wanted to watch Curse, the um, Wes Craven werewolf movie again, which... FYI, I really enjoyed. Fucking hell, that was... I know, but the second time I watched it, I was like, this is... Like, I get it now. I get what uh, they were doing with this. Yeah, but they show it twice. They show it twice. They filmed that movie twice, because the first time they filmed it, it was fucking oh, yeah, yeah, really I know, bad. I know, okay, I know. Right. But, it didn't um, come out great the second time, but fair enough. Or maybe I have to watch it again. But last yeah, time I watched it, it was... It, it was not well, I, the first time I saw it, I was, like, unimpressed. second time I watched it, I really enjoyed it. But... In searching for it on Prime, I discovered there was also another movie called Cursed. Oh, so I right. watched that as well a, couple, a year or two ago. Yeah. And then I realized it's also called Eight for Silver, um, which you well, you watched the other day. So tell us your thoughts on a werewolf movie. So it's been a while since we've discussed a lycanthrope story. Yeah, um, had Boyd Holbrook in it. Um, I knew a couple of years ago, a couple of werewolf movies came out around the same time. And I, I kind of just... I don't know. Didn't search them out. I thought, look, I'll find them eventually. That's the thing nowadays. I don't really do that. I don't. As soon as I see movies, I'm not like, I've got to get on it. I'm like, I'll get to it. <laughs> I'm a busy person. It's fine. I've got lists of movies to watch. Um, so, um, and it, it came on. I was like, so I sent Sarah a message. I was like, fucking, don't watch it. Um, I think that's a perfect one for us. I thought it was really beautifully shot. Um, I thought it was gorgeously shot. In fact, it's really, really, really foggy scenes and stuff. I don't want to spoil it or anything. Um, it didn't it was all right i think i can't really totally remember the ending now but i remember not being very impressed with the ending um but i like the journey yeah i remember thinking it was very well shot and a, a good looking film really but beautiful. i find it, i find it quite boring yeah sadly. for I a think, werewolf film it was quite boring i think that um, might have been it uh i don't want think... it or werewolf <laughs> Uh, oh, I know what a uh, problem I had with it. Definitely, I said this on our f- Facebook page. Um, my problem I had with it is that the werewolves look like they're out of that uh, Kate Beckinsale film, Underworld. Oh, Jesus Christ. And it's like, well, why? Und- underwear. Yeah, so why is it, in, in like, if that was, say, 2022 or 2021, they probably made it. So why is it? Why, why are you letting that happen? I don't know. Come on, it's guys. like it looks so good. It's a period piece. Is it for any if there's ever like, I love folk horror as a subgenre. If there's ever a folk horror werewolf film, I would say that's the film. Um, yeah. And they could have, if they'd made that werewolf like uh, just a dude uh, or woman or whoever um, in a um, costume on all fours running through the woods or whatever, and just shot stuff like that, it'd have been fucking amazing. So all you really want is someone in the woods on all fours, is what you're saying. <laughs> Yeah, wearing <laughs> furry costumes. Hello. Hello. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do CGI werewolves, the pinnacle, obviously, of CGI werewolves, as we know, and as our listeners know, is American Werewolf in Paris. That's the height of CGI <laughs> werewolves. That is the one. That is the I mean, one. I, I, almost I love that movie. Face. Almost get a straight face. Um, I still love that movie. And uh, at some point, we should just do a commentary on it. Uh, we, well, yeah. I mean, we've covered it already, but we should we should maybe do it again because we love that movie and everybody hates it. Whatever reason, I'm just like, oh, I don't know. It, it was. Uh, I I think I reckon with that movie, I watched it probably a, a, a few times. We probably had it on video, rented out, and watched it a few times. And I was probably in a really good place or whatever, and it just comes back as like a happy place to me. And that's what I think yeah. it must be, you know. Um, I did also watch very quickly again. I watched Chuck Still Night of the Trampires. Again, with Elijah. Yeah, He's like, you watching this on like, the last episode to our listeners and watch it twice. And then Sarah's like, yeah, we're going to have a double bill of films with the kids. And I was like, okay, cool. And um, we watched another movie. I can't remember what it was now. I do. I can't remember, but I'm not going to talk about it. Um, and we were going to do that again. I was like, yeah, I'll watch it for the third time. <laughs> Amazing. Um, it's so good. And like, Dan, when you watch it, you could be like, where has this been all my life? Like, I, I, I almost say, don't sleep tonight. Just watch it twice. Okay, I won't sleep. Honestly, you will fall in love with this film. As soon as you watch it, you'll be like, oh, this is my childhood. Do you know what I mean? You're like, this is so good. Um, It's just, there's this bit where where Chuck's still, because he's like a grizzled kind of, uh, he's he's like every 
detective you imagine he's got his his other detectives who steal the whole time like you know that sort of thing and there's this one bit where he's trying to chat this woman up and she's just like no and then um he's just trying to say stuff you want to go out no and she's like no it just keeps asking and he just doesn't get it he's just so like that he's just so like she's saying no no i don't want to know and then he turns around something else happens and she's now not focus point Whatever's happened, because he's a cop, something's happened. Oh, and he just looks around and says, Lesbian, give me the. F-, and just calls oh my God. It just does that. And it's just the way he does it, because it's not the focus point now. It's the humor like that is fucking genius. Um, so check it out. It's a very, very good film. Um, it, yeah, it, it's it's not very PC at times, you know, but it's really fun. It's kind of really 80s horror. Well, talking of grizzled cops, on a quick side note, yep. uh, and um, also talking of the eighties, I rewatched the Deadpool. Um, oh. Not going to not going to go on about it because we've already covered it for your birthday episode a couple of years back. But the Deadpool, it's one of the, it's my favourite dirty. It's so Harry good. Movie. I watched it's, it again getting a toe recently. It's ridiculous. It's got Jim Carrey, Liam yep. Neeson, and Guns N' Roses in it. Yep. In a Dirty Harry film. I I, I was. Getting Ben was tattooing me. Ben, director of Togfree for Deadbolt Films. Um, he's a tattoo artist as well. And an old director. It works quite well. Um, and he was giving me... He started on my leg. I'm getting a big evil dig, dead leg, um, which I'll show once it's completed. Um, anyway, I took it to him, and I was like, I've fucking got to show him this. I said, I brought a Dirty Harry movie. He's like, a Dirty Harry film, and put it on so we could watch it. And um, just while he's tattooing... He, obviously, he's tattooing me. He can't be watch it. But I sort of say... Okay, check it out, and he'd look up, and I'll say, "Here, this is a um, Jim Carrey. This is Jim Carrey uh, in a horror video uh, singing Guns N' Roses." So, what the fuck? And you go, and this Being is Liam, Liam yeah, and this is Liam Neeson. He's a horror director of a ponytail. So, what the fuck? And I said, at this point here, we've got a little remote control car which chasing him. So, what? And I was like, it's such it's a good great. film. It's so it's good. Great. It's like one of the last. Uh, 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 and these were Dirty Harry films and you'd expect a fifth in a series it to be kind of eh, it's, man it's a highlight for me it's my favourite it's my favourite I think there's um, a dip earlier on right? when he's with his wife uh, he did that one movie with the gang which is going around the city raping people yeah and he and I, I wasn't as good some of those ones a bit another movie I watched which is an older movie which I, I watched many years ago but now I'm a parent it hit differently was uh, a 1974 movie it's got two names Death Dream or Dead of Night um, all about the boy that comes back from Vietnam oh, yeah, war yeah. Yeah. and he's very different um, and man the ending of this hit hard for me you know as a, as a parent now um, the lengths you'll go for your kid uh, because when they realise that, you know, and this is a very old film, so I'm going to go ahead and spoil it, but basically he comes back, is he a vampire, or is he a zombie, is he both, has he been experimented on, we don't know, but but it basically, at the end, his mum and dad realise he's been the one responsible for all these murders in his small town, and yeah. um, his mum sort of tries everything to save him, even though he's a monster, literally, physically looks like a bit of a monster, she's trying to do everything, and then at the end when she finds him and he's trying to bury himself in his grave and she's trying to help him and the police turn up, and she's like, he's my boy, he's my boy, he came back, he came back from the war, and then the police shoot him, and it's just like, fucking hell, man. Mm. And I, I do think we should probably cover it one day, because it's, it's uh, oof, and it's Bob Clark, you know, Bob Clark directed it. It's just... A very dark and very different take on what the war, what especially what Nam did to people, you know, when they came back. Um, wow, well, I, I highly recommend it to anyone who's never seen it. And if you haven't seen it for a long time, go and check it out. Like I said, it's called Dead of Night or Death Dream, uh, directed by Bob Clark. And you think you're going to get the, you think you're going to get one film with it, but actually within ten minutes you realise this is very different, you mm. know. Um, oh. Yeah. Teaching, teaching Daisy the other day about what she was playing. She wanted to play Call of Duty World War Two, which you start off on that. I don't, I doubt you've played it. As soon as you start off on that, you start on the boat, and it's like get off the boat, go, and they're just shooting at you. And that is from the get go. It's so intense, and I only played it once on uh, when I had a projector. My old house used to live at with a big wall, so I had a massive surround sound. And I played it for a good few hours. And I became traumatised just from doing that. It was so like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's so full on. And I was explaining to Daisy, I said, you know, I said, imagine living that. And then you come back to just quiet, normal. 
Yeah. Everybody's normal. There's not guns going off. You don't have to. You don't you worry. You were killing women and children in a, in the forests of Vietnam or wherever it is. You were at war, and you come back, and you're expected to just just be normal again. And they didn't right, have any on. mental health care or anything like that oh, back then. They gave you your pension. You know, you might have lost an arm or a leg as well, just to add to it. You know. Yeah. Great shrap- shrapnel in the brain. And, yeah. and you come back to a place where, uh, especially America, though, but you come back to a place where there's there's guns around. And you're a hero. Hey, wow, you, you, you're back from the war. Thank well, you. Well, no, they weren't, though. A lot of Viet- Vietnamese Viet- soldiers coming back from Vietnam weren't, uh, weren't like, hey, they were just so like, like... Their families were pleased to have them back. Oh, of they course, were, yeah. You know. But a lot of people, because that's the first time um, TV uh, news reports were actually showing what was happening and they hadn't done that before previously um, because technology got better and stuff like that and uh, so people back home are seeing it then they've seen obviously both sides because there's obviously there's propaganda or not propaganda or it's always you know there's always different sides of things and uh, so then they came back they were treated like shit a lot of vets um which is like (laughs) really and this what this war is just the most ridiculous thing ever it's just crazy over money religion or, or or you know property territory or oil or what and it's just like really <laughs> but great movie and war has produced some great movies which you know are anti-war movies in a lot of way yeah. so you know, i'm not saying that thank god we had war because we've got these great movies but i'm just saying we got tropic thunder <laughs> fucking hell <laughs> um not related uh to that but i also watched deep cover which i messaged you about yeah yeah um because i've got the soundtrack i used to listen to it all the time it's one of those movies where i had the soundtrack before i ever saw the film but i saw the film eventually and then i rewatched it again the other day and this is my favorite jeff goldblum and my favorite lawrence fishburne um uh performances of all time so for anyone who hasn't seen it Lawrence Fishburne has to go deep, deep undercover and yeah. infiltrate a, a, a gr- drug smuggling ring. It's quite. Uh, it's might not be that well known because I've told people about it. And like, what fucking movie is this? And I said this is the first time Snoop was ever on a song. Yeah, Snoop and Dre were. were the they're in song, it. Deep cover. They're in it briefly in the oh, background. Okay. And it's well. a great, great song. I fucking love that song. I was so stoked when I found it on a record once at a car boot sale. I was like, oh. um, um, anyway, this is like if no one knows, it's like when we had quite a lot of 90s uh, mid early to mid 90s uh, hip hop movies like New Jack City Boys in the Hood Menace to Society um, but um, this was the soundtracks the... were often better than the films yeah the Juice time. there's quite a lot of them but this was quite a gritty one which nobody knows of but it has Lawrence Fishburne and Jeff Goldblum I showed Sarah uh, last year actually because um, she she fucking loves Jeff Goldblum um, and yeah yeah I showed, I showed, he's, and he's like, a what? cocaine said, yeah. addicted he plays a cocaine addicted womanising um, lawyer for the drug barons who becomes best friends with Lawrence Fishburne and then they form this like friendship but all the while Lawrence Fishburne is obviously an undercover cop really good uh, movie the best thing about it though that I never knew until this watch is do you know who directed it uh, I did at the time I can't remember remind me Bill, Bill Duke oh yeah 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 and I didn't even realise, yeah, yeah, yeah. naive that I am, that he directed movies, and he's directed quite a few. But uh, yeah, Bill Duke, you'd know, guys, from Predator, where he breaks a razor on his face. Yeah, it's incredibly well directed as well, and um, it's probably one of the best old films I've watched in a long time. Yeah. Um, that, that was like when I discovered, this is like Amazon again doing it for me, I all of a sudden discovered Ricochet with uh, Denzel Washington. Yeah, oh, that's good. Watched yeah. that for the first time, not knowing what it was like. I went, this is great. Straight away went on eBay, found a DVD copy, and um, bought it. So I was like, this is going in my collection. I really enjoyed this film. Um, so, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, it's well worth checking out that film. Anyway, should we get on to, the, uh, to our podcast? Yes, well, before we do that, because um, it's my birthday. It um, is, so really you should say when we get on to things. I've got a couple of news items that I thought might be worth talking about as well. Um, relating okay. to film, um, first one it should probably belong in the world of the strange category. Have you heard about what's going on with uh, David Beckham? Um, no, no. Yeah, David Beckham is suing Mark Wahlberg. Uh, no, I th- those words went across my mind for a <laughs> glimpse of social media somewhere, and I ignored it. What what's going on with that? 
basically they were going to be forming a, a gym, an LA gym business. Oh, okay. Um, and then Mark Wahlberg pulled out of it at the last minute, um, causing David Beckham to lose 8.5 million, which is probably not a lot to him. Uh, so he's now suing Mark Wahlberg for 8.5 million or more. I saw this, and someone said, someone worked it out. I saw a comment someone put. Someone worked it out. They said this 1.5 percent of his uh, 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 royalties, or whatever, or what earnings, uh, or, and they said it's like me saying. Uh, it's like me suing one of my mates for eating a slice of my pizza. <laughs> yeah. It's like me saying, Gav, I'm going to sue you. You owe me 100 quid. Yeah. It's really like... It is. It's just... Uh, it's I guess it comes down to principle, because if you do that low, you, uh, um, it's gangster, basically. If you let someone fuck you over, that opens yeah. up the floodgates. And as we know, Beckham is besties with Tom Cruise uh, and a lot of these big sort of guys that are poten- potentially in... So Scientology, we don't really want to talk about it too much because people are listening. Oh, fuck, but fuck them. No, they'll pull the plug on us. <laughs> fuck them. Well, let's get away from that story then. I just thought it was a funny, weird headline. But the other one, the big one, uh, well, actually two things. First of all, M. Night Shyamalan's new movie, Trap, dropped a trailer <laughs> a couple of days ago. Next episode. And welcome to the new podcast on Hoyt Hill episode. We're in a new studio this time. We're it's in some Scientology lab. They, they're dungeon. funding us. They're funding us. <laughs> um, yeah, Trap, the or new um, M. Night Shyamalan movie is coming out soon, straight into theatres, not streaming. He won't do streaming. Um, oh, hey, that's great. It? Uh, yes, Josh Harnett is in it. Um, I and saw, there's a, I saw there's half a the twist. trailer. There's a twist in the trailer. Uh, so the trailer, for anyone who hasn't seen it, this is no spoiler because it's a trailer. I'm not, I haven't seen the film. It's not out yet. Well, no, but in the, the, trailer, the, the concept is that is the concept. As a, a serial killer is being trapped inside a fake gig, isn't yeah. he? Uh, 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 and surrounded so he can't get out. But it is the but serial killer is Josh Harnett. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, and but then Which apparently there is another twist or two within I'm it. I'm sure there should shy, be. Um, but yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go watch it when I go to the cinema. Don't know. I think it looks really good, and I've always been a fan of Shyamalan. You know, for the most part, I like most of his movies. In yeah. fact, we might, we might, might be doing a Shyamalan episode in a few months' time. I might. I don't know, would I go? I might go if one of the dudes said it. I know Sarah wouldn't, because last time we went to watch that Beaches movie, did what was that Beach movie? Old, uh, old. Like, old, yeah. And she, I, like that. I, I didn't mind it. She didn't like it. And I <laughs> think she said, oh, "I'm not going to his movies in cinema again." I was like, oh, I think. Fair enough. But but that was one of the things I want to talk about. And the last thing I want to talk about before we 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 talk about Mr. Lundgren himself, the Swedish uh, giant, um, is Quentin Tarantino. Oh, he's changed his idea uh, again. I've not looked into. Has he changed his idea of his last film? No, he's cancelled it. He's cancelled. Yeah, so uh, cancelled his tenth and Brad final Pitt is film. The critic, and I was. Yeah. It was going to be Brad Pitt. It was going to be. I was thinking, why, why make that? You just did that Hollywood. Once upon a Hollywood is very much well, film industry. A, why do the critic? Do something different. It's a, it, well, it's a sequel to that. Uh, oh. It was going to potentially be. A, it was going to basically be a really meta. The theories are that it was going to be a very, very meta film, which incorporated everything Tarantino has done in his career. And uh, touched on other movies, but also um, had stuff. Oh, related. okay. I, that sounds fun. And but also related to his favourite decade, which obviously is the seventies. Yeah. Um, and it was going to be all about this film critic who, just by chance, touches the lives of all these people in Hollywood, much like some of the scenes in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood do. Uh, and it was going to incorporate everything that Tarantino's done in his career. There was even talk of like Star Wars but with Rick Dalton being in Star Wars, you know, instead of Harrison Ford and all this kind of stuff. But I think because these things are not, not so much leaking, but being rumoured, um, he's decided, you know, he doesn't want to make this movie anymore. Um, oh, he does know how that goes. With once, uh, no, The Hateful Eight. Um, yeah. But then he did make The Hateful Eight in the end. Um, yeah, so, he, he eventually did do it because he saw how good the, 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 the talk went when he got all the cast together and got them to read it out. But yeah, Brad Pitt was going to be Cliff Booth. Um, Leo was potentially going to be in it. There was also going to be talk of Tarantino, of um, Travolta and Michael Madsen. And I'm just... sure it would bore all of them in. But I, I don't know, once upon a time Hollywood, it's kind of like, it, is, it, is, it would be a, an incredible film if you're the age of Tarantino and grew up in Hollywood watching that stuff. I feel like I feel like there's bits of it I'm a bit like, uh, yeah, it's cool, it's kind of fun, but it's... 
Uh, I think what this means is he'll do what he did with the hateful eight. He'll stop for a couple of years and then he'll it, shake it up a bit and then come back and out. drop it. And it it'll be under sense. maybe a different name or something the like that. The thing is, though, he's put himself in a fucking boiler pot, though. He's what? got himself saying, this, no, is, my this is my last movie. So it's just like everyone, he knows it as well. Everyone's going to be up to him. He's already made 10 films, but he only counts Kill Bill 1 and 2 as one film. So technically, he's already made ten films, but he, he, this is oh, his no, that's fine. film. Um, but I'm I'm happy with that. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I'd rather I'd rather get him to go do something else. What's the best? What's his best film? In my opinion, hmm. Pulp Fiction. It's um, up there with. I think it's up there for me. Uh, is that next to probably um, the war film? Uh, and Glorious Bastards. Glorious Bastards was fucking amazing. Well, I've got to say that my my new favourite of his, although Pulp Fiction... Hate, but the Hateful Eight, I fucking Hateful love. Eight is pro- potentially his best film. Yeah, Hateful I Eight. know. Um, it's hard. Because that's a real slow burn, and you fall into that world that he's created, whereas Pulp yeah. Fiction is a little bit more snappier, and it feels yeah. a little bit more... It's very 90s. Yeah, and it's been done, but that's because he was the first one to ever do it, Pulp Fiction. Oh, but course. then... But then I do, I really love Django as well. Um, yeah, I can take, sorry. it's hard, but I think definitely for me, Pulp Fiction and um, Hateful Eight are up there. And his worst for me will always be Death Proof. I just don't think it's a very good film, which is, it's, no, a it's shocking, nice, a shame. shocking that it's a Tarantino movie, to be honest Kurt with you. Russell was a stunt driver yeah, and kills I mean, people. Should be elements. brilliant. I think it's too stone making it. I just love the fact that my, my parents have seen... Jung, Jungi, Jingo, Jongi, Django. Django. What? J- Jing, Jengi. I was like, what are you talking oh, What did you watch? To, you watched Django. You watched a Tarantino movie, and they don't even know what one about. When I say Tarantino, like, what is that? Is that Tag the Telly? Is that it's because it's, it's, it's no. got cowboys in it, and your dad thought, oh, let's that, watch it. That's, that's, that's exactly why they watched it. <laughs> it's exactly why. And it's a great movie. It's probably I'm, one of the Capri's best. I am. My mum's my, my gone away this week, so I should drop my dad around a DVD. Oh, dad, there's DVD for you, and it's broke back Mountain. Check this out. You'll like this one. It's got cowboys in it, It's dad. got cowboys in it. Oh, I get this old kid and all look like on. I'll watch it tonight. He, he, he would though, but he'd watch it. And he, he would be like, "Why would you give me that?" Movie? And he'd laugh at it, or or he'd go, "I don't really like that bit." And they, uh, you know, or he wouldn't say a word. Well, Alice recommended um, last tangent though. But Alice recommended um, a new series on Netflix. She's been in, in, engrossed with called Baby Reindeer, all about a comedian uh, who's got a stalker. It's a British Scottish. Um, uh, TV show. It's about eight episodes, and it's everyone's talking about it. It's the new, you know, Tiger King or whatever it is, and everyone's talking about it. And um, she recommended it to her parents on the second episode. She was like, "You guys have got to check this out. It's really good." But by the third episode, it was just full of loads of bumming and rape <laughs> and drug abuse <laughs> and blowjobs and glory holes. Uh, and I said, you, I, "I didn't watch it, but I, the bits I saw, I said, I said every time I look around, some bloke's getting rogered up the arse or a woman's knocking <laughs> someone off." It. I said, "I don't think your seventy-year-old parents are going to enjoy this." Oh, Tim, said, I don't like this one. She messaged them and said, "I'm rescinding my." Uh, my recommendation um i don't think and they were like oh well, we were going to start watching it tonight i was like no don't don't watch it well, i was watching uh, uh we'll get on to the episode soon guys i promise i was watching uh a second to last thing it was episode of 1883 um and i told my parents to go on it and they watched it and it's just one scene they start having sex in like a meadow and i was like oh this is going on for a bit while but the whole time it's on i'm just envisioning my parents sitting in their chairs watching it the whole time like, oh no and it was like oh it's still going Oh, it's not graphic, was I still going? Still Your mum's getting up, making a cup of tea. Are they still going There was a it? boob at it and that. And, so, oh. and I don't know what uh, what my mum and dad, the, the situation would be. They'd probably look at the dog go, oh, Frankie, and stroke the dog or something. Because <laughs> I don't know what would be the uh, dynamic at that point. Oh, dear. If it was me and Sarah at that age, I imagine that I'd be like, whoa, 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 and I'd prod her with a, a stick, like make a joke. Yeah, me and Alice, sort of, if, if I'm watching a programme, which a lot of the horror movies I watch have always got tits in them, you know what it's like when you're watching a lot of stuff from the yeah, 80s. Yeah, normally you go boobs. 
she goes, oh, 80s Bush, or I go, oh, Alice, check out that 80s Bush, or something like that, yeah, you know? Well, we, yeah, that's the, that's, the, that's the beauty of horror movies. I, we watch all good ones, shit ones. It's always great when a, a boob or something comes out, and it's not like just men being uh, uh, horrible men, going, oh, tits, yeah, ooh. It's not that at all. It's, it's just like, oh, horror boobs. Well, even when it's I was watching... horror the, movies. When I was it's... watching the, the Northman last month, you know, um, I was like, oh, Alice, look, 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 dick, dick. Yeah. Because Sarah said to me, oh, boobs, and she'd nudge me and go, oh, yeah, nice. You know, <laughs> stuff like that. It's, it's just fun. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, but we can't we all be serious because there's, there's, there's no point, is there? Anyway, you can listen to us funny fuckers now talk about a couple of movies. Uh, we so, should go yeah, on to yeah, a trader, yeah. really, shouldn't we? Yes, let's, uh, so let, we're going to start things off. We're going to do this <laughs> reverse chronologically um, because for many of you know that He-Man has a special place in my loincloth. Um but we're, so we're going to start with Dark Angel, Dolph Lundgren's 1990 Dark Angel. So let's uh, let's go into a trailer, Gav. DJ, to t- 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 take it away. Give <laughs> it to us, Dolph. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Houston, Texas. It's Christmas. Someone special is coming to town. And it's not Santa Claus. <laughs> Jack Kane, a cop who does things his own way. What are you doing? Shortcut. He's sensitive, understanding, and kind to strangers. Merry Christmas. But all that's about to end. I'm coming, peace. Three well-armed men have their throats cut before they can even draw their weapons. Who could possibly move that fast? Aliens. Say what? Are you crazy? It's true! You need a psychiatrist, Jack. Your psycho stole a lot of heroin to kill people with. What are you gonna do? Tell them we're we're fighting drug dealers from outer space? Huh? The human body carries a small electrical charge, right? You tune the disc to the charge and then... What the hell is going on here? As far as you're concerned, this case is closed. It's not our problem anymore. I've had a bad day. So that was the trailer for Dark Angel. So here's the synopsis. Dark Angel 1990, rated R. One hour and 31 minutes. The pirates. R. A renegade cop is forced to work with an FBI agent in order to bring down a group of drug dealers with sinister plans. Doesn't sound like it's going to be anything supernatural or alien, but that's a misleading but very good synopsis in some ways yeah um <clears throat> that doesn't really give it away at all i suppose really uh-huh. if if that was what you know you read at the video shop and you got it out or totted totted all the way home put it in the old vcr and went Fuck, what be quite good though because funny enough though you would have had that even with predator even though you might have figured out predator but if you didn't know like from dust to dawn you didn't know and you started watching it and all of a sudden you have this bit and you're like Oh, yeah. Th- this is actually very similar in a way it felt like Predator, might, maybe more so Predator 2. Um, yeah, it was like that. Very much so, yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, that's how it was for me, because my dad and I saw this for sale in Wool- Woolworth's department store, and 
it, we just immediately saw Dolph Lundgren and that that was enough and he bought it um, and we that I think probably that night we watched it together not knowing anything about it we didn't bother reading the back, back of the box or anything like that so when it turns into a bit of an alien thing we were like ooh so yeah I was really pleased with it and it's Dolph Lundgren being Dolph Lundgren but he's actually doing some good acting in it some good action as well just about to say out of the two movies we're doing tonight this is my favourite and um Dolph uh, acts better in his Master Universe. He acts terrible, and it could be obviously direction. It could be it was a couple of years before, didn't have his chops on or whatever. But his acting was very bad. There, there's a reason Th- for is, that. Okay, there's a reason well, for it. Th- 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 we'll get on to that later on. Um, which we'll get into. But th- yeah, here, absolutely fine. Really weird. His partner in this, which is the FBI guy, he's got to have with him, is actually absolutely likable and fine, yeah. but. It's kind of weird. It does feel like it still should be cast for someone else. It doesn't feel completely correct the way he looks, but his mannerisms, his characteristics, and the way he puts himself across comes across in at times easily on toe to toe with uh, Dolph Lundgren. And the FBI but visually agent. doesn't look, look it though. But 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 I think that's the fun. I assume it is, is because he's weapon. smaller. Dolph yeah. Lundgren's bigger. He's about a foot shorter than Dolph, isn't he? And yeah. he's called Larry. I, you know? I, I guess that is it. He just doesn't... I don't think has a complete... Like, he couldn't lead a film himself, but then again, Dolph Lundgren... But, but what I like about that dynamic does. is, again, he's bringing, his, he's bringing it all to the table, that guy, because he... And his character starts off as a bit of a dick, but by the end of the movie, they're like partners fully in this mission together you know and it, it's kind of got that rush hour lethal weapon buddy cop so it's all of these things it's predator to buddy cop lethal weapon mixed with a bit of highlander uh, and i just think it works really really well well you got to see this is also made with that 80s money that 80s cocaine fueled money yeah indeed and this is all about drugs as well um which we'll get into when we discuss the weirdly the, the plot. Weirdly, which I said, said, of course it's not. It was heroin. Yeah. That's such a weird choice. Um, And it's directed by Craig R. Baxley, uh, who uh, also directed a really great movie called Action Jackson, if anyone's ever seen that. Yeah. Really, really good movie. Uh, He also directed um, quite a few episodes of the original A-Team series. Um, And sort of did a few bits and bobs, but he he did a lot of low-budget action stuff. But... um, uh, his two biggest movies were Action Jackson and this, really. And this actually is, as I said earlier, it's been cited by a lot of critics, is one of Dolph Lundgren's best films. It kind of yeah. flew under the radar. It was originally going to be called <clears throat> Lethal Encounters, but they thought that sounded a bit too much like Lethal Weapon and Close Encounters, but that was the point of it. So they changed it to um, I Come in Peace in the US, and then over here it was called Dark Angel. Um so they, they kind of changed that and no one really wanted to to make this film um a lot of studios turned it down and they went ahead and made it and it's actually an independent film um because at the time they didn't really have any studios back in it and then actually when studios started seeing it there was a little bit of a fight over who would <clears throat> take yeah. this on and then and when it got released it made quite a bit of money for the short time it did at the cinema. And then on video, it's really be- became, at the time anyway, again, it's not very heard of, but at the time, it was a bit of an underground, oh, have you seen this Dolph Lundgren movie? Do you know how the film came about at all? Do you know Do you know if uh, you say it's independent? It was, like, was like Dolph Lundgren a main component? Was he a producer? Schwarzenegger was going to be in it originally. Right, but do you know how um, it's made though? Like, um, did, did they get the director afterwards, or was the director involved first? Of all, or what, what do you know? I, I don't know that aspect of it. I'm afraid because the director has a distinct. It, they knew the vision that they wanted, and they managed to actually capture it the best that they could. But they actually had like, oh, this is A, and there's B. Okay, everybody, here we go, and they they've pulled off exactly what they wanted to do and they've managed to get out of every character in the film you've got good i'm looking at the stills now on imdb and all these stills have these great performances just in the stills and of really good performances from everyone across the board so it's a very it's a it's a definite six out of ten well, for me uh, here's a bit of background for you then funny enough um so just before this film was made, the director Craig Baxley and Dolph Lundgren were actually going to be making another film together called Man to Man, which is going to be an action sci-fi comedy about an alien crashing to Earth. 
um, while he's in the Nevada desert, he hitches a ride with a repo man, and the two of them go on an action field adventure while searching for the alien spaceship. The script was already written, and it was ready in 86, 87. They were working on it. Then he went and made Action Jackson. Um, Joel Silver said, if, if you want to make this film, I'll back it, but you have to have Arnold Schwarzenegger in it, not Dolph Lundgren. I don't want Dolph Lundgren in this film. Um, and we want Arnold Schwarzenegger to play the alien in the movie. Um, but, but because he'd made Predator, Dolph Lundgren... And um, it's too close to Terminator. Yeah, and Dolph Lundgren was too... Um, Schwarzenegger was too expensive at this point. Um, so in the end, they went back, and Joel Silver said, OK, you can have Dolph Lundgren then. Um, and then well, a few days... You could, well, you, you could, if I, you know, I always could get to that point one day, Dan, me and you could be hanging out and we go, let's we just quickly chuck out all sorts of in Dark Angel and see how it looks. And, and we'll check it out and it'd be like, yeah, it kind of feels like it's one of his movies, you know. Well, a couple of days before, and this answers one of your questions, um, they were beginning uh, shooting sort of less than a week before they started shooting Joe Silver and another one of the big producers involved Bernie Brillston had a massive falling out and the entire crew was stranded waiting in Vegas and didn't know whether or not the production would go ahead <clears throat> uh, they couldn't decide who they would want to be the co-star to be the FBI agent so they hadn't they cast him literally a couple of days before they said action on the first scene uh, and eventually they got that guy in they got him in because he was hilarious and also likable. So all the things you described, but again, so the film almost didn't get made. Um, they, they were literally on like, is this going to be made? The, the, all the producers are fighting. Interesting that Joel Silver was involved in it as well. Yeah, but I can see this like um, <clears throat> with a actual studio back in it. You, you'd have had a kind of up there with Lost Boys type thing, but like, do you know what I mean? It'd be is in production wise. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I, I'm looking at the stills now, but just seeing if you'd had that bit more money, and definitely. But to be honest, like when it comes down to at the end of the day, it's this could be remade. It's one of those movies that could be remade, really. But um, yeah, it's a good, it's a, it is it's a, a good, good film idea. regardless. Uh, regardless of budget, it, it's a six out of ten for me. If it had more money in it, it'd probably be the same. Something you know. else that works really well in this film. Um, is it's not just London or anybody else that's in it or the aliens uh, two things that work really well is the score I think the score is really good in this uh, and in fact the score was liked so much that the guys who made Miami Vice basically reused some of the music for episodes of Miami Vice uh, but the other thing that works really well is the alien is quite scary in this um, it's, it, it, I wouldn't have mind. It's, it's like horror movies when you don't know what was the reason of that. Zombie movies like we had that with the dead. Don't know the reason, like last episode. Um, we don't really know what's going on with these uh, much, do we? we? We do a little bit. We know what kind of what they're doing. Yeah, but, but we don't know anything about their planet or their or species. Their backst- no, nothing. So I don't know if I really like the look of them. It's a bit. Yeah. I think I think that's what's kind of maybe it's because of the age I was at, but that's kind of what got under my skin a bit. because they were just these huge hulking blokes, and they were bigger than Dolph Lundgren, you know. And you're like, wow, you know. Yeah, it's, a, it's a strange look. It's just a strange design. He it's, looks it like being the Carpathian, doesn't he? It does seem odd. a bit cheap and easy, to be honest with you. But maybe that was what they had to work with. They said, let's go with more natural look because it's easier and cheaper, probably. And it, but it, like you said, it is a very um, sign like made in the eighties movie, you know. Um, and there's the nine, the late eighties, early nineties, all all the way through this. Um, but yeah, I think we should get into it. Let's, let's... Uh, I think we should. Okay, great, great. So as we said, we got Dolph Lundgren in this, and he plays Detective Jack Kane. Such a badass, blokey name, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and then we've got Larry, who's the um, the, the FBI agent he gets paired up with. Um, and the only other person really of note in this is Ao Leung shows up at one point. Oh, he does. He, I loved it when I saw him. Fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself, man. And he just runs off. Um, but yeah, let's get into this. So we start off with just a random guy driving along in his car. Oh, he's got a CD player guy, but he must have a bit of money back then, you know? Yeah. Puts his CD, starts skipping a bit, doesn't it? And this is a bit of a motif throughout CDs. Um, it turns out that the, one of the weapons that the aliens use looks like a CD. Um, but we'll get into that in a minute. And his CD flies out of his uh, car radio. And he ends up crashing his car into some trees. And I realised at this point, oh, 
this is a Christmas film. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can start watching this over Christmas. No, I was like, that's a Christmas movie. Which is great. And you've got carols throughout and Christmas trees here and there. Yes, so. we, we find this occasionally, Jaws 4. I know. Christmas double bill, Jaws 4 there's, and Dark Angel. There's another one we had recently, which was a Christmas movie as well, we found out. We were watching it. Yeah, what was that? It was over... I found out recently that well, Rambo, uh, First Blood, is a Christmas film. It takes place over Christmas. Yeah, yeah, because the sheriff's... A, when he takes over the sheriff's bit right at the end, he sees the Christmas trees. Oh, actually, where he's arrested. There's little Christmas trees on the uh, police station desks. It's not really mentioned. It just happens to be. I know, I know. Oh, it was Christine. That was the other one that was takes place over Christmas as oh, well. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Lots of randoms. Anyway, um, he crashes his car into some sort of Christmas trees and a little display, and then all of a sudden he hears, and some sort of missile explodes his car. And this is where we see he's he's credited as Bad Alien. Wow, that's his name, Bad Alien, and he it looks like if Vigo the Carpathian from Ghostbusters Two was about a foot taller, but had white eyes and uh, just a bit of a weird forehead. This is what this guy looks like. He's got a big trench coat on. He looks like he could take on an army on his own. And indeed, he probably can. And he says, I come in peace. Yeah. Um, yeah. Grabs the guy and we don't see what happens. Now, what's good is, don't worry, because as the kills go on, they get more and more brutal. I don't know if you realise that or if you notice that, Gav. The more this alien kills people, the more we, we see what he's doing to them. Until one of them, actually, we see them him puncture someone's skull. Um, really fucking harshly. And an uh, alternative title for this movie, in fact, is Come in Peace. I Come in Peace. Yeah, in the US, this is known as I Come in Peace, but I think guys over there know, know it's the Dark Angel. Dark kind of cool. Yeah. Well, the reason they, one other reason they changed it was because there was that TV series with Jessica Alba oh. called Dark Angel. Which, oh. Um, which is James Cameron, so they, they kind oh. of... But yeah. So then the credits kick in, um, and we start off with this film doesn't really take a breath which i like um we just kick straight into someone breaking into the evidence room um in a police station and i love these kind of movies someone's broken in he's he finds uh, he kills a cop that's in there um he puts on a, his fake cop outfit he, then he goes over to the big shelf full of heroin yep um takes that takes some money as well um one of the security guys is a bit suspicious and uh, he sort of leaves. One of them drops a suitcase on the stairs, and he says, "Oh, we better, uh, we better put your foot down." And he's like, "Well, everything's gone successfully. We've got the heroin, we've got the money. What are you worried about?" And he's like, "Just, just drive." And he explodes the entire police station with that bomb. He just killed everybody in there, just <clears throat> for shits and giggles. The other guy said, "Why did you do that?" He says, "No witnesses." And they all just laughed. Wow. And that's where we're going with this. It's gritty. It's got that 80s Robocop, no fucks given violence, which makes us great. Um, cut to Detective Dolph. Detective Dolph. And he's listening in uh, in a wire. He's got a badass car. He's a bit like Cobra as well. He's got elements of Cobra in this. You know what I mean? He dresses oh, well, in his well, own way. Speaking of Cobra, Cobra turned up one day on the set. Oh, no, that's Master of the Universe. He did, yeah. Well, you can tell that story now, you, though. You gave this guy lines. Yeah. Well, actually, let's talk about that briefly then. So you mentioned earlier that his acting, but the part, part of the reason his acting looks maybe subpar in Masters of the Universe is because he was told, we're going to dub you over. So it doesn't really matter how you deliver your lines. But then they started running out of time and budget. And they were like, shit, we're going to just have to use Dolph's dialogue. Uh, that is no excuse at all for not being professional and just doing it anyway and doing a good delivery. Hey, it was his first English-speaking role. Come on. Yeah, well, I can't have any excuse. That could be like, uh, actually, I should be—I should probably do a good delivery just in case they don't have enough money and they can't finish it and they have to use my lines. Ta-da! Yeah. Come on. Okay. Be a bit more fucking movie. But obviously, by this point, he'd um, done a lot more movies and, and stuff like that. Yeah, and so a bit got, more. yeah, yeah, totally. In this movie, Dark Angel, is fine. Absolutely fine. So Dolph's listening in on a wire... Uh, to something that's happening inside a building um, in, in a nightclub. And he sees the fake cops that have just stolen that heroin and the money. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> this is quite a good bit, actually. It's, it's really like interesting film. Straight away, there's a lot going on 
from the get go because you've got this happening and then all of a sudden he's outside listening in a while listening to something and he's like oh there's a drug deal going on and obviously I'm about to go in there and bust them when, it, when the right moment turns up but what goes and happens is a robbery next to him in a convenience store so he's Cla got in this classic. dilemma he's in yeah. what, what do I do and obviously he has to go fuck as he has to go and do that and well, what that his happens best friend as well his partner and best oh, friend and what happens well his, so his partner and best friend is undercover, but they know he's a cop. And But all of that happens when Dolph has to take his earpiece out and go and stop a convenience store robbery. Um, so whilst he's in the convenience store, his partner is getting killed because they know he's a cop and he's undercover. Before, before he does get killed, again, another movie which does it again every time. It's like, how do you do this? The, the, the guy who's buying said drugs... So, so it's heroin, picks up the bag of heroin, through the plastic, sniffs it and goes, mmm, what does that mean? It means he knows his heroin, Gav. <laughs> how is he doing that? What's it, is it uh, how much mm. indentation his nose does into the packet? Argentinian, I'd say 1972. Mmm, it's like wine tasting. It, it's like you can't sniff it, it's wrapped up. Sorry to our Argentinian listeners, I don't know if heroin really does come from... I don't really know where heroin comes from, to be honest. Um, I don't really want to know, to be honest. Yeah, there's, I was about to, yeah let's not start getting into that. <laughs> That's um, not the sort of tangent you want to get into. Where, where's heroin coming from? Well, let's get let's talk about it then. No, uh, it's not. But these dumbass armed hoods, they've, take, they've held up a convenience store, a liquor store, and they do not know that the meme machine himself, Dolph Lundgren, as I say. So he heads straight in there. First thing he does when he walks in is a double kick, spin kick. First one takes the gun at the guy, the second one kicks the guy. And you're like, okay, Dolph means business. Now, we'll get into this later, but Dolph is very highly and trained in many martial arts. He is quite a big guy. If he does a roundhouse kick or 360 kick on you, it's probably when that comes around to your face, that's probably going to hit. Uh, well, funny enough, this stunt, this uh, stunt man missed his mark and came forward too much. So the well, take that they used. He fucked up. Dolph Lundgren took the gun out of his hand, but then the guy carried on coming forward, and then the second hit that Dolph does with his foot to the guy's face, apparently the guy went flying back and was unconscious for about five minutes. You got knocked the fuck out! <laughs> Dolph Lundgren span kicks kicked you into fucking sleep for five minutes. I bet he had a headache when he woke up after that. But yeah. it looked great, and it's... For such a big guy, man, he's so agile. Man, as a filmmaker, uh, that happened, obviously. Is he okay? Oh, he'll be all right. All right. Look back at his DP. Thumbs up. <laughs> Dolph, Dolph comes over and goes, did that look all right? Well, let's watch it back. It's, it looks fucking it great, looks Dolph. fucking real good. Is he all right, um, though, yeah? Great. It looks good. Uh, let's, Dolph, not, let's not celebrate. If they die, we probably should not celebrate until, just in case. So Dolph ends up shooting the um, the guy holding at the convenience store. Um, and like I said, while this is all going on, his partner is also being killed, which he doesn't realise. And then bad guy alien appears. I come in peace. He fires a CD at everyone in the club uh, where the drug deal was going down. And now I say a CD, a compact disc, but it's actually not. It's like an alien weapon that happens to look like that. <laughs> But it flies what would you do for a weapon? Uh, CD? What, yeah, CDs are quite new. I mean, they weren't really, but um, but it flies out, and basically they work out later on. So to jump ahead, they work out that this can be this can be programmed to hone in on so anything magnetic, and all human bodies carry a magnetic vibration within them. So it basically, he fires at humans, and it can try. So it's like a homing missile. It's kind of it like a one predator. Throat, predator so the next one those, predator's got this thing, hasn't he? Well, Batman does it in Batman Returns. He fires his batarang, but he programs it, and it takes like six guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that sort of, yeah. But well, yeah, we we could get him, Dan. We could have a uh, fucking boomerangs, dynamite, Dan, and Gavatron. That's I can't. The thing is, I've tried. I used to have a boomerang, and I was fucking. I was throwing it to just go, and I'd be like just walking forever, just picking it up. That's <laughs> all it was. It's just me getting steps in. Well, Dolph enters the club after shooting all those guys. He goes back in the club to go and see what's going down with his partner, Ray. And Ray is dead. And there are bodies everywhere. And he's like, oh, fucking hell. I only stepped away for five minutes to solve another crime. And everyone's dead. Um, so it becomes a crime scene, obviously. And uh, all the crime scene investigating departments show up. And they're talking about, well, there's five dead here. 
Um, you know, what's going on? Dolph's in trouble. It's a typical lethal weapon. On my notes, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a theme now, so it's, it does put me off. I'd wrote Dolph. My notes every time change it to Dolphin. So I've just got Dolphin. So I've got Dolphin turns up. Dolphin so, Lundgren. So I'm going to be saying Dolphin. just because Somebody out there owns a pet Dolphin that they've called Dolphin Lundgren. Oh. You know that. You know that, don't you? No. That's so good. Dolph. Have you met my... Oh, I've got, you know, a rich guy, you know, Basos or someone like that. I've got a Dolphin in the in my swimming pool. Dolph, his name is. Dolph Lundgren. Dolphin Lundgren. And he's also got Stephen Seagull that lives... And it's like, yeah. that's, that's not <clears throat> that's not so yeah he's in trouble with his boss like all cops were in the late 80s and early 90s why didn't you tell me you've been undercover for three weeks you've been missing we thought you were dead yeah. there's been stolen heroin taken five thousand dollars worth of cash is missing from the evidence room uh, you're fired you can't find me all right well i'm gonna make you take an eight-week vacation you're taking an eight-week vacation and that's the end of it Oh, and while you're here, the FBI want to speak to you now, so you're fucking in, in a lot of trouble, Dolph Lundgren. And the whole time he's like, oh, I'm going on a holiday, I don't want to go on a holiday, you're going on a holiday, okay, I'm going on a holiday. And that's it, he's very obedient. Yeah. Then he gets out, the FBI says, right, we want you back in the case. He's like, okay, I'll go back in the case. And his, and his detective's like, no, no, inspectors are no, you're not going back on the case. Well, the FBI say to him, basically, there's something suspicious about this. Um, I, and Dolph says, well, it's not a knife wound. I can tell you that from my experience. Whatever that is on their throats, it's not a knife wound. So like you say, they get F the, the FBI get him reinstated. Uh, and then he says, he does say to his boss, well, I said I'd take an eight-week holiday. I didn't say when I'd take the eight-week holiday. And his, oh, boss, and his, his, boss, his boss looks a bit cut up. His boss thinks, but we went out for beers last night and I paid for you to have at least two. And also, <clears throat> when Jack came, when Dolph Lundgren says, I promise, he never breaks a promise. So he said, but you promised me you'd go on the eight-week holiday. And he says, yeah, I, I did, but I never said when I'd go. But so, in theory, you could keep that until you die. That's true. So I will go on the holiday at some point. Don't worry about it. I, I, I won't be here sometime for a period of time. Forever. <laughs> um, morning comes, and this is the Riggs meets uh, Murtagh scene now. So... They walk in. Dolph Lundgren, I'd like you to meet your new partner, Larry, the FBI guy. Dolphin and Larry. Dolphin and Lazza. And as soon as he meets him, he's like, I know what you're thinking. I'm very young, but I'm the youngest graduated FBI agent in my class on to, top of everything. Yeah, to be fair, he does do that. He does plead his case from the get-go because he's going, you know, he probably thinks I'm a fucking... It's that typical movie. It's that typical dynamic. It's that typical partnership we saw in the 80s, 90s with films of the... Uh, the fucking tough, tough gritty cup with the uh, dweeb or the, it's, it's the weird hour, partner. It's, yep. the it's all sorts. Yep. You know, um, it's even and 48 hours, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, yeah, yeah. Um, it's the buddy cops uh, in a way, but yeah, well, they are both cops. But, but, sense, but it, it doesn't always work, but I feel like it really works in this because there's a, such a good arc with them both. Um, and then both quite stubborn, but then they and they rub each other up the wrong way. But then they realise you know, one of them knows more about the underworld. One of them has more access to FBI, so they have to work together. Do you know how it works? Like, because they kind of complement each other, I think. Because it works because Dolph isn't bigger character than he is. If it was Sylvester Stone, it wouldn't have worked. No. Well, it works because of a scene we'll get to in a moment as well with Dolph's house, because um, he judges a book by his cover. Obviously, he sees Dolph as this huge guy, really muscly, big leather dolphin. jacket, dry, big dolphin in a leather jacket, driving around in a muscle car. <laughs> <laughs> like, Imagine you know. that. My notes say at this point... That turns Larry's, some heads, wouldn't it? Larry seems like a jerk, my notes say. Uh, we also find out that Dolph Lundgren's uh, girlfriend is in the police department too and she slaps him i love you put your little suspicious voice in there right after you did your little story voice story voice suspicious voice back to story voice i like that yeah well she cr she's very cross with him because apparently he's been gone for two or three weeks and hasn't told anyone where he is and it's because him and his buddy have been undercover getting this drug deal set up and he didn't tell anyone where he, where he was not right. even his girlfriend um <laughs> yeah the, the other <laughs> note <I've> got... <laughs> no it's so funny you wouldn't tell her, would you? Even though she's in the police. Is that nah? I'm undercover. 
I love it. Yeah. Fuck I, you. I, I'm undercover. I'm, I'll tell you. She'll be down chatting with her mates. No, she won't. I'm being a very chauvinistic man. Don't worry. She wouldn't be gossiping at all. Uh, but yeah, the other thing about Larry, the FBI guy, which we've already touched on, is just how short he is compared to Dolph as well. There's this moment where he kind of squares up to Dolph Lundgren and you just think, yeah, you're going to... I think Dolph says to him at that point, that's one. And he's like, one? One what? And somebody says, well, you've got three strikes with Dolph Lundgren. That's how it works. And he does this throughout the course of the film. Like, that's two. Whenever he gets pissed off, you think, you don't want to get to three with him. Three you know Dolphin strikes. Happen. Three dolphin strikes and you're out. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do a dolphin. No. Uh, anyway, let's go. Let's go to a homeless shelter. Let's do it. There's a homeless shelter. There's a few homeless people milling about in there. You know, living in there, sleeping, doing crack, all the things that homeless people are doing in the nineties. Um, and there's a big explosion again. A big missile hits, and good alien shows up. So there's another alien, and we don't know he's good at this point, but he's he's got a dark hair compared to the other one and it's like oh who's this guy i was watching the other guys yesterday you see oh, the yeah. other guys yeah yeah i like that when, it, when the real frail's prius is stolen they get it back but uh a load of homeless guys had an orgy which they class as the soup kitchen mm, disgusting. <laughs> it's awful isn't it um so yeah good alien so we've got another alien now uh he doesn't kill anyone and uh that's all we see of him um, so Dolphin and Larry uh, go back to the crime scene, the nightclub, and they hate each other's guts, but they're both stumped. They can't figure out, you know, how what, what killed these five guys. I know, the, the, the adventure is going to bring them both together. Yes. Uh, we get a quick kill from um, the bad alien. A man calls his dog in um, and his lights go out in his house. He grabs a gun because, you know, America in the 90s. Whoever's out there is going to get a face full of lead. Yeah. Um, I come in peace. It's the alien. And this time, we see a little bit more. The alien jumps on the guy. Do you think the aliens, cause we, we, you know, when we talk about the aliens, do you think we should really work out what's going on with these guys then? So how do they, can they just, and they just appeared? Oh, no, no. They're just running around, aren't they? Yeah, but, 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 but I mean, I, do they come through a portal or do they come on a ship? They came on a spaceship. Yeah, spaceship. Okay. Uh, and um, do you think that they figured out the English language and then they realised that those would be the best words to say? Yeah, first? because because my theory is they would have picked up on us sending out signals mm. into space mm. throughout the 70s and 80s, and one of those would be I Come in Peace, which is always a very big thing, you know, lots of lots of movies in the 70s and 80s that, that dealt with aliens. So I think if they, they think if I say that, I've got limited vocabulary, but if I say that, then they might go, oh, okay, great. I'll, I'll let you come over and sit on my chest and then puncture me. Yeah. The giant spike. Have you seen Contact? Um, yes, I have. Yeah, there's a bit in there which is so, which was so creepy. I thought it's like if we're not uh, for a non-horror movie, it's extremely creepy when Jodie Foster gets the signal back from space. The first signal back. Oh my God, we're gonna. I've got a signal, and the, and it's bloody Hitler talking. Mm. That was the creepiest thing ever. Could you imagine that? The first thing you get, and it's Hitler. Like, of all the people, of all mm. of them. I mean, he lives on the moon, as we know. Even know, Jimmy so. Sowell would have been better. Jesus Christ. You know. Now, Ren, now, Ren, now, Ren, people of Earth. <laughs> Fuck you, <laughs> <Fuck> now. <laughs> Jim has fixed it for all of you. <laughs> actually sounded a bit, a bit like him. That's scary. Um, so, what we see this time, this kill, is after he says, I come in peace... He certainly doesn't, because he jumps on the guy. Now, when we say alien, they are human. Or they look like humans, but with just white eyes and, like, 10, ten foot tall. But um, he jumps on this guy, and he pumps something, which we later find out is heroin, into this guy's chest. He gives him a massive overdose of heroin, and then he shoves this blade on his wrist into the guy's skull. So, to cut to the chase of what this alien is doing, on his home planet, um, the endorphins that are produced from heroin in the human brain they are a drug on his home planet a highly illegal and very very lucrative drug you can become a billionaire or whatever credit they use on his planet because it's from humans and that's not allowed presumably 
So he come, he's coming to Earth, and he's basically he stole a load of heroin. He's pumping up a load of random people with heroin, taking the as soon, as, soon as, they, as soon as it gets to that point of their brain, which is good, taking it out there. Taking and, it out, and then he puts it in a little capsule in his bum bag. Mm. He's got a little alien bum bag, hasn't he? And, <laughs> yes. or, or fanny pack for the US. And and then he's, yeah, he's good to go then. And he's going to go back. Do you think he's on the street corner in his planet going, guys, guys, I've got some uh, human adreno glands in my bum bag. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think, yeah. I and they're like... Dirty dealer, isn't he? He's got some fucking human adrenaline. This is amazing. Let's get on that tonight. So you got a load of. Fo- so the thing is, we don't actually know about is the aliens fucked up, lying around on the adren- human there's adrenal like, gland. There's loads uh, of parties going yeah. on on his home planet. <laughs> alien, alien rave music playing, and they're like, "Get another, sh- get another capsule out. Come on." Oh Do they God. sniff it? Do they inject it? Exactly. Do they put up their alien bottoms. If they've got bottoms, they hey, might not. and they plug it somehow, somehow. But yeah, so and that's what I like. We don't know. We don't know this kind of stuff. But Gav might ruin it if we knew. If we all of a sudden had a scene of a rave, an alien rave, it might ruin it. But the oh, next, but go on. Yep. <laughs> I was going to keep going. I'm not going to do that. Um, just before this, we had uh, someone drinking some eggnog, and it's a wonderful life on telly. Just want to yeah. say that I well, enjoyed that's the that. Guy that's just been killed. Yeah. I know, I know, but I just want to say because I enjoyed that. Further, um, you know, for anyone who doesn't think Die Hard is a Christmas movie, then you're probably not going to think this is. But this is definitely a Christmas movie. They rub it in all the way through. Uh, the Die Hard movie is not a Christmas theme movie, but it's a Christmas set movie. Yes, it's as simple as that. Thank you. I sound like Alan Partridge. Now it's 1990, so our next scene te- sees us in a strip club. Boobs. boobs that is everywhere. my note. That's my note. It just says boobs. Larry and Dolph Lundgren step in there, and he says, "Why are we in here?" And Dolph Lundgren says, "It's the only place I can come to think." He talks to the dude from House of Thousand Corpses. Yeah, he does. And he says, "He says, well, how, what do you mean you can think in here?" And he's like, "Well, I come in here and I think about the cases I'm working on." And he's like, "How can you concentrate with all of this around you?" Um, and then, yeah, he sees his snitch, the guy from House of a Thousand Corpses, but he's also in Scrooge. Uh, his name's Boner. Of course, he is. And he goes up to him. He says, "Hey, Boner." He's playing pool. Oh, we give you Boner Bone. Yeah. Well, that was my nickname at school, sadly. Yeah. Um, from the age of about uh, eight to about sixteen, um, and it was only when I was about fourteen that I realised why. Well, not why. My nickname was Boner just because my name was Bone and they added an R, but um, I didn't realise what Boner meant until I was about 13 or 14, and then I thought, for fuck's sake, my nickname <laughs> means, means erection. So the whole time, you're like, oh, Boner, you are like, hey, guys, how's it going? <laughs> when we left school, me and my best Did you go, hi, get, uh, uh, so this is Debbie, hi, Debbie, I'm Boner. <laughs> well, you did. Come is, on. No, 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 Did you because introduce yourself as Boner? At school, right, everybody was just, no one was called by their name. It was it was either a nickname or your surname, or your surname, if your surname didn't end in like an R, mm. then you'd have an R thrown on the end of it. You know, so if your name was like Smith, you'd be Smithy, and everyone would just call you Smithy for the whole of school. You know, so it wasn't until we hit 16, and then we left school, and me and all my best mates... I can still remember the conversation as clear as day. It was like two days after school had ended and we were all be starting college that September. And we were all sat around, you know, Rob's house. Um, and I said to them, guys, can we just make a pact? Can we just stop calling each other by our nicknames now? And everyone was like, yeah, all right, Dan. And I was like, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Dave and Paul. And and it was like, wow, we can... The, the weight of the pressure of all those 10 years of being called by a name that wasn't really your name. That's so funny. A boner. One of the guys was called Smurf because his surname was uh, Smith and he was really small. So everyone <laughs> was Smurf. He wasn't blue. But he could suddenly be called Michael. Finally. Oh, oh, Michael Smith I was I feel like I've I feel like a flower has just bloomed. Honestly, I couldn't believe I was getting called Dan. And we, we really hammed it up the first night we, we hadn't realised this. We were playing Mortal Kombat uh, and we were passing the remote control or the um, Mega Drive, Sega Mega Drive controller between us and we'd be going, your turn, Dan. Thanks, Dave. So you're just all sitting there and one of you, you, you just go, guys, just been thinking about it. Yeah, yeah, what? 
bang, 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 play Mortal Kombat. Uh, could, could we drop the nicknames and just say our actual proper names? Yeah. Okay. But obviously, obviously everyone it's, has been thinking it's it. It's like a scene from a film. Obviously, we'd all been thinking it. It's just a coming to, of to, age, to maybe. Say it. it was great. Yeah. But, but this guy that Dolph Lundgren goes to speak to is this snitch, and his name is Boner. And he is playing pool with his buddy. I was about to uh, say Dolphin Boner, but I won't say that. No. Um, he, Dolph asks him about the drugs. He says, who killed my partner? Come on, you always know what's going on. Um, and then the guy's like, I don't know anything, honestly. And then he watches them play pool and watches the balls bouncing and everything. And then he gets inspired by something. And he says, let's go back to the crime scene, Larry. He's been listening to Rick Rubin's audio book on creativity. Well, he's been watching a Dolph, uh, Denzel Washington movie called Ricochet because he realises that this weapon is probably ricocheting off of each of the dead bodies. And he describes this theory to Larry, who thinks, you're full of it. What are you talking about? And he says, if that's the case, then it should be over here somewhere. And then inside the speaker, they find this metal disc, which is basically a compact disc. And for whatever reason, it's a, it's a CD. For whatever reason, it's a, a Tiffany CD. For whatever reason, <laughs> it stays stuck in I the speaker. Really well, because it's because of the magnet in the speaker, isn't it? Ah, uh, so it, okay. It, 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 it's, it's, that's what I said earlier. It's programmed. It's not very strong. It, frequency. They're not very strong magnets in speakers. Uh, maybe one of those big ones in the nightclub. But either way, hmm. it's, it, it goes to anything magnetic, but you can program what frequency. And in the human body, there is a magnetic frequency, which is what the alien, they've got an advanced technology. They kind of explain it quite well. Yeah, I'm not going to start trying to work logic into this. I'm just going to let it go. Well, they take the disc out of the speaker, it flies around the room, almost kills them, and then goes back into the speaker magnet. So they decide, Dolph that says, look, I'm going to take the speaker with me. I'm going to take it home. So um, that's what happens. But the good alien... He, he does... Uh, uh, it's quite good here. The, the director almost puts across where <clears throat> we don't know if we can trust the FBI guy. The whole yeah. way through this movie, I thought he was going to be a sneak and he's not spoiler well, he's and he, fine. well he is and then he isn't yeah but not very much not very badly but well like, he steals the disc from the the, the science luck guy and uh th i take it all back yeah no he, he completely um he's a rat but he completely stabs Dolph in the back but then well we'll get to that he redeems himself um but the cut to the good alien who's out hunting around and we cut to a character very similar to Argyle from Die Hard. Yeah. Got a black chap in a forklift truck, <clears throat> just driving along, listening to some dope 90s hip-hop. He's got his headphones on. He doesn't see what's going on. He opens his eyes. And there's an alien in front of him. And it's the bad alien. Mm. Shoots him up with heroin. Takes the uh, adrenal glands out of his head. Um, and then we get a shootout between the good alien and the bad alien. And then we start to realise there's an audience. Ah, this other one is chasing that one. Okay. And these guns, Gav. Let's talk about these guns. And these action scenes, in fact. The guns that they use, you know, look pretty meaty. But when they fire, they, they cause these massive pyrotechnic oh, explosions. Yeah. Fucking massive, aren't they? Uh, and the fact that both of the guys playing them are so big, and when they run, like, one of them's running across loads of parked cars, and you can really feel the weight. Of, you know, these, these guys definitely come from another planet where there's different gravity and different technology and stuff. It just all looks so good and mm. different to anything we were seeing, really. I agree. Um, and I, it does remind me a bit of Highlander, the first one, anyway, a little bit, in that there's this, this other world going on that's infiltrated ours that we don't really get. I like it. I like it. Um, the baddie jumps out of the building, lands on the floor. He doesn't get hurt, and he escapes and runs off. So that's that's that. Now we get um, Dolph taking the speaker home, and this is the scene I mentioned earlier. Yeah, Dolph and his partner go back to his flat. Um, yeah, so Larry has been judging this guy, by his, judging a book by cover. And when he gets there... His Dolph Lundgren's flat is full of art, fine wine and books, Paul good Taylor. classical music. And he's like, wow, you you really aren't the guy I thought you were. And he's like, yeah, you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. Would you like some wine? Yeah, which he drinks in one gulp. The what whole dickhead. glass. 
but I mean, like, a whole class. It was quite impressive. Um, but yeah, they basically... He starts to realise Dolph Lundgren isn't the badass. I mean, he is a badass, but there's more, a lot more to him than I first thought. Um, Larry then says, well, I'll see you in the morning. Uh, I don't feel comfortable about leaving the CD and the speaker with you, the alien weapon, but I will. Um, and I'll see you in the morning. Dolph sits there and he thinks and thinks about Diane. He's brooding. And he just thinks, oh, do you know what? It's three in the morning. I'll go around and see her. I'm sure she'll let me in. So he knocks on the door. She slaps him across the face. She goes to slap him again and he grabs her wrist and he says, are you done now? Then they kiss. Sexy time. Sexy time. Um, and, yeah, they. she obviously forgives him for vanishing for three weeks because in the morning when he steps into the police station, he's got a bit of a pep in his step, hasn't he, Dolph Lundgren? He's like... <laughs> do, 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 I didn't do, notice that, but that's I quite... I sex last night. That's do, quite do, do, nice do, do, uh, continuity point, then, if it did. <laughs> Yeah, he's, he's quite happy that, for Pepper that, that, If that is actually actually as it is, do you think that's the director or the act, uh, Adol- Adol- Dolph guy? Like? I don't know. It's just he gets back to his apartment and he's sort of, hello, to the security guy, good morning. to the. the I'd say the like, director probably said to him, it, like, more than likely, say, uh, you know, you just got laid in the last scene. So uh, I'll be a bit more happy. You know. you know, like in Wayne's World 2, where Garth loses his virginity to Kim Bassinger, and oh, in the yeah. morning, he's like, good morning, everybody. I'm a man now. And he's like smoking a pipe. You know, it's... I forged past it. I was watching it with Elijah. Okay. Recently. Fair enough. <laughs> um, but when he gets to his apartment, the door is open. Someone's been... Someone's broken into his apartment. So Dolph Lundgren pulls his gun out immediately. You know, you don't want to fuck with Dolph Lundgren and his apartment. No. Uh... And, and put a pin in that because that's something I'll be coming back to later on uh, a real life thing um, so he walks into his apartment and Larry's in there now Laza, what are you doing here mate Dolph Lundgren says to him what are you doing here and he says well I got here and your door is open your apartment's been trashed I think you've been robbed now Dolph starts saying well hang on are you, when did you get here and he starts thinking did this guy do this and then say somebody else has done it it turns out Larry actually did do this and took the disc yeah, uh, yeah. well he didn't take the disc now he takes the disc later but yeah um, he says where's the disc and he's like don't worry it's with a friend and what, what he's done is he's given it to Diane to look after um, so while he, he said to her, look, I'll give you a bonk tonight. We can have a bit of a nice shag, but you've got to look after this speaker with a Tiffany CD lodged in it. Do not. He said this to his partner. I, don't, I missed no, that no, bit. No, no, I'm making, I'm making this bit up. Oh! But Diane has got the speaker with the CD in it. No, not Dolph saying to his partner who might love to him after he drank that wine. <laughs> no, you're going back too far, too far on the scenes there. He didn't, they didn't make, make sweet love after the wine. In a different type of movie. Um, it would have been. We get another kill now. Lady mechanic. She is grabbed by the alien, drugged and drained of all of her endorphin. Drugged and drained. Drugged and drained. That's what they could have called this. Drugged and drained. Uh, no, because that sounds a bit. I, I don't know. I don't want to watch drugged and drained. That so there is a awful. bit. There is a bit of a there is a bit of a stalker a slasher vibe to this movie because we do get these quick kills of this bad alien just taking people out, you know. Interestingly, if you take any shots of the actual alien away and you cut them out and just had the deaths happen, uh, you could easily not even think it's a science fiction type thing. Yeah, could be just a straight up. Yeah, like, like, a, like a mystery, trying to figure out who it is. Yeah. That would be quite good, actually. Um, Fan edit. Well, we get to meet the um, crazy scientist laboratory guy now, don't we? Mm. My God, he is unhinged. So Dolph says, let's go meet my friend. This dude I is... I knew you are going to like this guy. Fuck me. This dude, he... He just loves his job. He definitely has no girlfriend or anything. And he Never sleeps. drinks yeah. coffee like no business. And for some reason, he's like, he's fucked on, on, I don't know what he's on, but he's just so like, the drive is so like there, but he's got no, he's, he doesn't know what he's driving towards. That's the thing. He's just oh. manic. 
Dolph says to him, oh, um, I wonder if you had a chance to have a look at that disc that I brought you. And he says, yeah, why just does, give me... Why does Dolph even think he's a good one to go to? Because he's the best. He's the best. I guess, I guess, uh, uh, the best, all this, most eccentric. Well, he says, he says to um, Dolph, yeah, one moment, and I'll explain it all to you. And he turns around and faces the wall and goes, ah! <clears throat> Right, that's out of my system now. Yeah, so basically, who's this guy? Oh, this is my FBI partner, Larry. What? He scoops all of his pills into a drawer. These are all prescription. And he's like, I don't care about any of that. Just tell us what you know about that. So this guy is like really jerky, jumpy. If you took a blood sample from him, it would be like 80% caffeine, 20% drugs. Yeah. Um, and he explains to them the whole magnet thing. And he's got the mag the disc now hovering between four big magnets. And he says it's electromagnet, nothing like I've ever seen on this planet. Um, but it can be programmed. Uh, it's technology I've never seen before. And I guess you could use this to program it in, to hunt down humans because we all carry magnetic waves in, within our body. So that kind of is it's as much exposition as we need, really, in a film like this. But it does it pretty well. Dolph then goes to the morgue because more bodies have been brought in with puncture wounds in their head and heroin overdoses. And he's like, hang on a minute, someone's going around giving people huge heroin overdoses and shooting them in the head. And, he's, and Diane says, no, 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 no. These, these aren't bullet holes in their heads. This is a puncture wound. Someone's stabbed into his head. So the plot thickens. Yep. And while he's in the hospital, randomly, Dolph gets a postcard from the big baddie, Victor Manning, um, who sends him a picture saying, hey, I'm in Rio, having a great time. Wish you were here. So he's like goading him because he killed his partner, Ray, at the beginning. So it's all it's a bit of a... Didn't really need that, perhaps, but... No. But there we go. Um, but the... I love the name of the drug gang, which we haven't mentioned yet, actually, at the beginning, the guys that deal with the heroin. And they're crossed because that was their heroin that was taken. They're called the White Boys... Probably because they're all white, but also they deal in heroin and cocaine. So they're the yeah, white boys. Yeah. So they're driving along, Dolph and Larry, and they realize they're being followed by the white boys. And they start shooting at them. Um, Larry pulls his huge Dirty Harry Magnum out of his um, coat, and they start shooting back. Really good car chase scene here. They end up playing chicken against the baddies, and the baddies sort of chicken out so Dolph and uh, Larry escape uh, and Dolph then goes to uh, where does he go next oh he goes he says I'm pissed off now they pushed it too far they're coming after me yep. so so he goes to Warren's office um, <clears throat> he gets there and he sets off all the car alarms outside just to cause a bit of a distraction he sneaks into the office he beats up a couple of guys That's in it. the boardroom um, he pulls the gun on Warren. Like, he knows that Warren is like the head of one of these sort of. What, what, what is his plan though? Just going to the meeting and just fucking start waving a gun around. He just says to him, he says to him, you, you, I know you killed Ray. Um, I know you're involved with the white boys, and everybody in that boardroom pulls a gun on Dolph as well. And you're like, okay, you're in trouble here, Dolph. But Warren says, put the guns down, guys. Put the guns down. Uh, and Warren explains to him that there's a drug war. And he says, I know that you stole my heroin and my 5K. The white boys want that back. And Dolph's like, it wasn't me. I didn't do it. And he's like, well, someone took it from that drug bust that went wrong where loads of the white boys were killed. So they're after you now, Dolph. There's a hit out on you. by the So not only is he dealing with these aliens, he's now got the white boys after him who want him dead and they want his, their money and their drugs back. So it's not a great day for Dolph Lundgren. Um... Dolph says, well, that's not going to happen. We're not, oh, I could just kill you now. And they said, well, we've got some collateral. And they bring Larry in. Larry's been captured. And he's got a gun to his head and the tables have been turned. And they say to Dolph Lundgren, the only way out of this is if you make the, um, the drug drop off, we might let you off. But you're going to have to drop off some of these drugs now and do the, do the whole the deal for us. So he has to go ahead and do that. This is where Ao Liang shows up. For anyone who doesn't know, Ao Liang is a Chinese gentleman. It's a chocolate bar and die hard. Chocolate bar eating <coughs> guy and die hard. Yeah. He's he's Endo in Lethal Weapon. You know, he's in Big Trouble in Little China. He is got a, usually got a goatee. 
Mm. Um, he's fought everyone from Brandon Lee to Dolph Lundgren to Jesus, everybody. To uh, Je- Jesus? What movie fought, was that? He had a fight with Jesus. In Kung Fu Jesus? I've never seen it. Uh, there is actually a movie called Kung Fu Jesus, which I've seen. It's fun. Oh. Fung Fu Jesus. It's pretty badass. So, yeah, he heads into the pawn shop that Al Leung is running, but it's actually not really a pawn shop. It's a drug. It's all a front for drug running. He opens a suitcase, but he gets double-crossed. Al Leung gives him an empty case. He says, go fuck yourself and tell the white boys to fuck themselves too. Normally, he's got a heavy Asian accent, but in this film, he's just got like a standard American accent, which always throws me. Um, He runs off with all the heroin. Dolph chases him out into the alleyway, and he finds his body hidden in the corner and the alien has attacked him and then the alien attacks Dolph yeah but but the other alien's there as well he is he <clears> steps <throat> in and there's a huge gunfight um, Larry manages to fight the white boys off and go out and help and the alien escapes with all the heroin like he wanted to go to fat boys but it's white boys fat boys as in as in the <laughs> <laughs> yeah I wasn't having a seizure for anyone listening then. I was doing an impression of the the Fat Boys um, beatboxing. So all this has gone down. Lots of gunfire. You know, the tables are turning a little bit. They've also got the white boys after them. So Dolph goes to visit Diane. um, And she sees the bruises on his throat. and says, God, who's done that to you? And it's obviously it was the alien when he grabbed Dolph Lundgren's throat. Um, She then explains the whole endorphin thing. Um... And her theory, but she says no one on this planet, <laughs> on this planet, has the technology to be able to do this. Why did so she you, word it like that? I I worded it like that. Oh, okay. The subtext, though, you know what I mean. All right. Um, it's it's funny though because the, the the alien in this is like the predator. The predator's coming to hunt. The alien is also coming to hunt. Yeah, it's just using <laughs> us. Hunting ground, basically. Just using the humans. Maybe they maybe they live on neighbouring planets and they just see humans as a source of drugs and sport. I don't know what else. So that means that they they know we're there, but they're just like, oh, we could go and visit them, and they they do probably come and look at us. Maybe they do tours. That's what UFOs are. Yeah, they're alien tours. Well, look, there's two of them having sex in a car. I've over broken there. it. I'm gonna I'm gonna declare this on my next my other podcast, Hot Strangers podcast. Um. It's what they are. They're tourists. So there's like an alien Richard Branson who takes people on tours of planet Earth. Yeah. That's What's what that is. one doing down there? It's He's quite wanking. expensive. That one's wanking, look. Yeah, they can do whatever you want. It's like looking at monkeys or whatever, like the zoo, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> That's what they're doing. That's what these guys are doing. They're like, oh, let's get some more drugs from the fucking drinks. You've heard it here, listeners. That's what UFOs are. I've broken the fucking code. Well, Dolph reveals at this point to Diane and Larry that he thinks it's aliens aliens and they don't obviously buy that initially well it, Diane's uh, a bit more on board generally when people say to you I think it's aliens you're like uh, what have you been smoking yeah but he's been around the block a few times this guy the Dolph Lundgren to know that this is not something he's dealt with in the past um, they say you know no one's going to believe you but anyway they go back to the scientist from earlier the caffeine man and he has had the shit kicked out of him, hasn't he? <laughs> He's had the shits. He's shit had the shit kicked, kicked, kicked out, out of him. him. Uh, yeah. uh, and the disc was stolen. Um, yeah. And he says to Larry, they looked a bit like you, actually. They were in suits like you. So some of the FBI have gone round there and it, the it, shit out of him, taking the disc off of him. Uh, I guess, it, you know, like you said, he's the best of years. But I was like, I wouldn't trust him leaving him with that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't trust him with my coffee. Mm-hmm. Who knows what he'd put in it. Um, but Dolph tells him his theory. And he says, so you're saying that he's a drug dealer from outer space. You really think anyone's going to believe that? No, no, I don't think they are, are they? Um, we get another alien fight between the good and the bad alien. The bad alien escapes, but the good alien is injured in this in this fight. It does seem to be like another alien fight. Then. It's another yeah. alien fight. It's, like, it's, it's the same blueprint as a slasher. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, we cut to a kill or an alien fight or an alien kill, and then we cut back to the main story. Um, but it, it works. It sounds weird when you're going back and reviewing it, but it works because, like I said, it never lets up, this film. It just snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. Um, 
the weird thing now though is when they go back to the crime scene um there uh, because there's there's a, a whole load of people killed here in this store when they're at this crime scene the good alien is spying on everybody and he's sort of thinking well which one of these guys do i trust the most probably that Dolph Lundgren guy i'll go and speak to him in a minute but the fbi are there and they basically say to Dolph Lundgren, forget it forget the case the case is closed it's all finished you don't need to know anything more about this now um and just go go on your holiday it's all dropped even his boss tells him that and this is because of course the fbi want the aliens and the technology firstly to be a secret secondly they want it all for themselves because it's the government to x files and all that kind of stuff um yeah so um dolphin gets it dolphin <laughs> you're making me say it now. <laughs> dolphin gets in his car and in the back of the car is the good alien bleeding everywhere because all of my notes is dolphin <laughs> and, he, and he says to him he basically says to him this this man must be stopped i'm a i'm i'm like you on my home planet i'm a law enforcer like you so he basically is a, he's like a Dolph Lundgren from another planet he's a cop and he's hunted this guy all the way to earth um and says i'm dying i'm gonna die soon but you've got to stop him larry gets in the car and sees him as well and he's I don't, like, but i love the whole time though he's persuaded to this girl to go, he's going on holiday. He said, oh, I'm going to take the holiday. You're coming with me. And she said, what? Oh, what, really? Yeah, yeah, you're coming with me. Fuck it, you're coming. Oh, oh, but I'd have to quit my job. Quit it. Meet me. Come on. Oh, okay, I'll do anything you say. Qu- quit, sir, job. We'll get to that, though. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, the alien says to him, promise me you'll stop him. And obviously, as we've said, when Detective Jack Kane says, I promise, he never breaks that promise. So he promises this alien he will stop this this uh, bad alien uh, to be fair if he did break his word to an alien it's a fucking alien christ don't be racist i suppose it's your word though it's not about who it's who it involves yeah, it's you <laughs> okay well then um he sort of dies because he's so ill uh, and shot and larry says well at least we've got the body's evidence and then the body what does the body do gav uh, it blows up blows up the car but larry manages to retrieve the gun the alien technology gun which i love um because it's got like four settings on it they don't know what it does but there's like level one level two yeah, level but he takes three, it level to four. the bad, bad guy doesn't he well he, he does yeah well, larry says i got this gun as proof um i'll go now uh and Dolph's like oh don't do that and he's like i'm gonna go and you know i'll look after it but he shows it to his gut his boss and this is where we find out that his boss is getting him to double cross off London because he's also got the disc, the the spinning disc of death. Um, and he says, now you're new to this job, Larry. You've done a good job so far. And I'm not going to ask you to kill Dolph Lundgren. Don't worry. I won't put that responsibility on you. And he's like, what do you mean? So although he double crossed him, he didn't know quite how bad the FBI is at this point. Mm. Um, not saying if they're listening that they are bad, of course, you know, um, and he says, oh, what do you mean? And he says, well, we need to use the alien technology for the military. That's why we're doing all of this. And he pulls his gun out and goes to shoot Larry. But Dolph shows up, kills the boss. And Larry realizes Dolph's a good guy. Dolph realizes Larry was in over his head. And this is where they become. They might as well do a fist bump here because this is where their partner is. Double dragon. Double dragon, baby. Dolphin dragon. Double dolphin. <laughs> Double dolphin. <laughs> It doesn't seem, it doesn't that seem as, like as hard as, as when you're a kid. What? The, the double dolphin sounds like a sex position. <laughs> the double dolphin? I gave her the old double dolphin last night. <laughs> oh, did you? Hey, what does it mean? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it could be. Something to do with blowholes. It's got to <laughs> be. Uh, but yeah, they arrive at the alien's hideout, which is in some kind of weird cemetery. Um, and they basically say, Let, let's kick some ass. Uh, they find his massive pile of heroin. Dolph tries to fight the alien, but obviously the alien is so strong. And Larry gets his arm sliced by the flying compact disc of doom. I'm not sure which album it was this time. Was it uh, Prince's Batman that did it this time? Bam, 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 and where, and where. Batman. It's the Batman. 
Um, they're chased by the alien. Uh, Larry manages to shoot the alien. Did I get him? Did I get him? But he's gone. Uh, and then it gets a little bit repetitive now, sadly. Yep. That's a lot of these films do. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a lot of going to places, shootouts, going back to places, shootouts. I know. It's, it, it's, it's unfortunate because it kind of... It, it sort of shows, obviously, that there's lack of a budget, but this is where you just cut, cut, cut some of these things down or just change them or different locations or different things happening to change it a bit, I think. It's a couple of great moments, though. Um, one of them is the alien, the bad alien steals the cop car and gives chase, and he's chase them. It's a great car chase, all practical, um, because this is pre-CGI. So, and, Just before this, very quickly, the girlfriend turned up and said, uh, I've quit my job. That's right. I've quit my job. And he's like, um, that holiday's going to have to be... Uh, oh, yeah, they, you know, I persuaded you. Know. you. Yeah, nah. She's just going to be like, men are such dicks. And it's like, yeah. Uh, this car chase goes to smashes through a shopping mall. Um, more cops get killed. Larry blows up the car. Um, great moment where he blows up. He says, I'll put this thing to level three on the gun. Blows up the cop car with the bad alien inside. And he gets out and goes, whoa, I got that son of a bitch. And then out of the flames, the alien just starts sprinting at them. And yeah. it's quite a terrifying moment. He's like, yeah. it's like the Terminator, isn't he? Hello. Um, or for anyone that's played Resident Evil 2. Um, whatever that thing's called in that. Uh, you said about the score. Uh, at this point, I felt the score was really lacklustre because you've got these incredible explosions going and also action. And the score was like, oh, what is this? It's really weak in comparison. Fair enough. I like the opening score. And yeah, I don't remember the opening score, um, uh, but I didn't dislike it. So, you, do you know what I mean? It went past. But this one, I, I could feel the dislike for how it wasn't uh, complimenting the explosions. Well, we basically end up in the end scene of Robocop now, because they go to what looks like big the set of Robocop, a yeah. big sort of foundry, or maybe Terminator that? 2. Have you seen or... Robodoc yet? I haven't watched it yet, no. Mm. It's on the list, don't worry. It's, um, a, it's a biggie. And they, they, they have this big shootout, and they duck and dodge underneath pipes and stuff like that. Uh, Dolph says to him, Look, I'll give you the drugs. He starts throwing the drugs on the ground and smashing them and says, if you let Diane and Larry go, you know, you can have the drugs. But um, he tries to then do a Mortal Kombat. Get over here! The alien fl- fires his little heroin snake out of his arm, tries to get Dolph. And they have this big struggle. Um, and then he says, I win. And, uh, and then he says, I come in peace. And Dolph shoves him onto a pipe and says, and you leave in pieces, asshole. Uh, and yeah. puts the gun up to level four and blows him away. Yeah, this whole ending here was just kind of boring. I don't know why. It's just like, it was so good earlier on. Uh, uh, there's a lot more sense of adventure and things going on. But yeah, this bit here just really felt... So many movies we we review together, the last twenty minutes always feels a bit like it's, oh. it's a really it's a really hard point. I think that and the ending sort of towards the second act and that it's a really hard part to get in story sometimes. Correct the the fun the setting up is easy, then it's fun in games. So for the rest of the first like forty or so of minutes, you're just having fun. Then, you, then something changes, and it goes downhill, and then well, you come back up. But it's that bit there, which could be a bit hard. Well, there's a reason why films like Lethal Weapon and Die Hard, if we're talking action films, Predator, there's a reason why they live on as classics. It's because they managed to stick the landing. Yeah, the formula, they, it's, yeah. You know, the, the, the end works. But what I would say is, because um, it ends on a freeze frame, you know, with them all laughing. But what I would say is, this film is very lucky that it's got a great story and a great cast and great direction and, and cinematography so that you kind of forgive the last 15 minutes, really, because you, you, you've been on the ride. You sort of, by this point, you've had, if you drink, you've the, had like your the, sixth the, beer. The, the and fun's arrived. It's, it's not the yeah. ending. Yeah. Yeah. But all in all, I was really happy to revisit this. It's yeah, been a long time since I've seen it. Yeah. Um, and your first watch. So what, what do you think? You know, tell me your thoughts. Yeah, it was, well, you know my thoughts. Um, yeah, I thought it looked good. Um, I thought it was well-directed. Um, I thought it was 
absolutely fine everywhere apart from that score I thought could be a bit better later on and t- the, the, basically the, yeah that last bit being a bit tighter and a bit better a um, bit more different it's yeah, original it's though quite yeah. an original story you know yeah, alien uh, drug dealers yeah yeah yeah. but it has got elements of Predator 2 slash you know Cobra slash the, the Weapon you've got a movie called The Borrower yeah it reminds me of that as well alien comes down and has to put off people's heads to be able yeah. to breathe but they run out, so he has to keep getting over heads and just ripping off people, which, as a kid, and I watched it, I watched it on a big cruise ship one night by myself in the middle of nowhere. It's, like, I mean, like, no one around anywhere. It's really weird. And um creeped me out. I thought it was really disturbing. Watched it again. Got it on videotape. I found it at a jumble cell. And uh, it wasn't very good. It also reminded me, there's not that we like these movies that much, but in some of the Critters films, you get the um, alien... Uh, bounty hunters come down as well so it's kind of got those elements in it but but this is great if you've never seen it guys uh it's a thumbs up from me i think gav's giving it a thumbs up as well yeah, yeah um, it's fun you know it's a fun it's a friday night flick you kind it of really is you kind of know what you're getting into so yeah uh, and it's quite an original story with, with some fun scripting and good good looking scenes so yeah that that's it really but i'm glad we watched it i imagine this did well in the video shop to be honest with you when it came out i imagine it's the one pick up and went yeah i'd be all right i remember, like i said to you i remember <clears> my, my dad buying it we, we we bought it literally because it had Dolph Lundgren on the front um we didn't look at the back or read about it so we, we watched it that night together i was probably about 12 13 maybe and we really enjoyed it and it's been one that me and my dad talk about in fact i told him we were talking about this he said oh that's such a classic film classic film i'll have to dig my vhs out so he's going to be watching it at some point over the next week as well because he loves it has he got lots of vhs oh yeah yeah. it's like me still watches them occasionally you know if if he it's like vinyl records to him the same with me if i've got it you know like when that time me and you watched halloween together and i I pulled out my old vhs and it was so blown out wasn't it the coloring was all like weird on it do you remember it was hard to watch actually yeah man yeah it wasn't the Blu-ray. It wasn't 4K. No. <laughs> but um, either way, I still love pulling out my old... In fact, when I watched... <laughs> watch, Finished what you're saying there? VHS tapes. <laughs> in fact, our next movie we'll be reviewing, I watched that on VHS because when I was with you Pulling at a car out boot my old sale... Pulling out When I was with you at a car boot sale, I found Masters of the Universe on VHS and I've still that's the copy I watched. Oh, nice. For, for our review on this episode. But yeah, thumbs up from both of us. Dark Angel, 1990. Now it's time... Tar- Oh, what's he doing? Bill? What's going on here? Oh, he made me a birthday cake. Oh, that's very nice, huh? In the shape of... What is that? In the shape of... Is that supposed to be a penis? I don't know. If it is, then what's that bit coming out the end? Uh, it's an alien penis. Let's see. So it's like an alien xenomorph, but there's a little penis coming out of the penis. I like what you've done there. That's quite clever. Yeah, you can eat that bit. Um, there's got to be a porno out there of Bill with this in it, right? Where a penis comes out of a penis. With Bill Murray? I don't know. I don't know if you're in it, Bill, are you? No? He's winking. <laughs> Dirty bugger. All right, come on. Come on, Bill, take us into World of the Strange, please. Hi, welcome back to World of the Strange. Wow. Oh, wow. Strange. Oh, 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 oh. It's a very strange one. Thank you for that, Bill, as always. Now, Bill, I'm so sorry, I'm going to have to do this. Gav, what Bill presented me with was not anything that I could read out. It was to do with dolphin sex. He's got hold of the wrong end of the stick for my birthday episode. He's he thinking the- back to that episode you did, and you told me about the lady in the house. The dolphin that tried to have its way with her. Uh, old world, the strange. Yeah. So I knew this would happen, Bill. Don't look sad. It's my birthday episode, and I'll do what I want. So I knew this would happen. So instead, what I've done is I've prepared a list of interesting facts about Dolph Lundgren for you, because he's a very interesting character. I also thought we could have a quick chat about action heroes as well, and what makes an action hero, and why we don't really get many anymore. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Hmm. <clears throat> well, let's start with Dolph. Did you know that Dolph Lundgren, do you know what the average IQ is? Um, average IQ is 100, isn't it? Exactly that, yes, well done. 
Dolph Lundgren has an IQ of 160. Mm. That's quite a bit, isn't it? Yeah, he's an incredibly intelligent um, man. I think he's six foot five. Obviously, he was a model. So, so he's, uh, I presume everything's big, even his penis, because it seems he's got a big brain, big intelligence, big muscles. <laughs> he's big. Like Everything seems to be big with this fella. I, I don't have that information in Mr. this list. Mr. Big. Um, but he graduated from high school with straight A's. Big shits. Yeah. He studied engineering at Washington State University, and then he did a year in the Swedish Marine Corps. Then he got a degree in chemical engineering from the uh, Royal Institute of Technology. Then he got a master's in Sydney, so he's lived all around the world. Master's and in what? <clears throat> uh, I think it was chemical engineering as well. Okay. What, engineering? Uh, chemical engineering. And then he also got a scholarship in Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT. Okay, so is he essentially a chemist? He is um, uh, like Bio -bio -chemist. La laboratory chemist, all that kind of stuff, really. Um, but he quit. He quit two weeks after he got his scholarship. He quit MIT because... He didn't want to shake test tubes for a living, he said. Um, and he realised he could make a, a bit of money as an actor. Um, but he says, I'm not smart. Come on, I'm not that smart. But he's got an IQ of 160. Mm. And he's he's widely known as one of the smartest, not only action heroes, but just people in Hollywood. Interesting. He also speaks six languages. Did you know that? That's pretty impressive. Uh, his, his mother tongue, obviously, is Swedish, being a Swede. But he also speaks uh, English, obviously, German, Spanish, French, and Japanese. Fucking hell, Japanese is a bit of fun to learn. Yeah. Did you ever hear about the fight he had with Van Damme on the uh, steps outside Universal Soldier? No. Yeah, so you can find this on YouTube. Um, they're outside on the red carpet in their tuxedos and um, they get into a bit of a scrap and they square off against each other and the security guards have to come in and sort it out. But later it was revealed it was all just a bit of a a show. They they were told that they would do it, you know, to, to get the press and, the, you know, for the Universal Soldier because it was the two big guys getting together in a movie. But it's still at the time everyone was going crazy for it because there's no internet back then. 92 so yeah you just got these two guys getting into a bit of a scuffle and squaring up against each other imagine that so you just got like a stills from the video in magazines i've seen it on youtube though you can watch it at then before the internet when it oh came first sorry happened. yes 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 indeed it probably would have been on so some it looked, news it stories looked more, yeah true and it probably looked more of a thing when it is edited down like that yeah, it was all a publicity stunt, like I say. But the film it worked well because the film made ninety five million at the box office. So, fair enough for those guys. We talked about his martial arts. So he started karate at the age of ten, Dolph Lundgren. And by nineteen, he was part of the Swedish World Championship squad. He went to Japan to do full contact karate. Full contact. Mm. He said you had to be a brain as, belt. What's full contact? Just kicking someone in the face as hard as you can. There's no pulling punches or kicks. Not no. You're not getting points or anything like that. You're just knocking them out. Right. Um, but he said you had to be a brown belt to go to Japan. And I was only a green belt. But, but my instructor just said I was good enough to... I'm big enough to fight in full contact. I thought, oh, my God. Imagine gonna... going against him. Go to, oh, it's your turn. <laughs> okay, here we go. Oh... Look at him. He's six foot five. If you look at get close to his legs to get you. He did say, I thought I was going to get killed, but he won his first two fights of the tournament by knocking his opponent out. Uh, and he went on to win two European Championships and the Australian Heavyweight Karate Tournament as well. So he's three, he's won three national international tournaments of karate as well in the 80s. On the, on the, on the, uh, the, the trajectory of an action star. Yeah. Absolutely. 
I think I'm going to get killed. He's I'll on just the knock action these two train. Guys out. He's on the action train. He's putting some fuel in the fire. Well, let's let's get into how he got into acting because it's an interesting story involving um, an interesting woman, as I'm sure you'll know. But when he was studying in Sydney, Australia, he was working as a bouncer in a nightclub. Now, again, just picture Dolph Lundgren being the bouncer on the nightclub. Some little drunken Australian, like, oh, come on, mate, let me in. And he's like, sorry, I can't let you in tonight. You know, a huge guy. He's not going to let you in, is he? He's like the door. He is the door. He's a big guy. <laughs> but while he was at the, um, the nightclub, Grace Jones came to the nightclub. Oh, OK. I don't know this story. OK. Uh, and she said, do you want to be my bodyguard? Did she say, pull up to my bumper, baby? She probably did. Well, later on she did. Um, so he worked for her in Australia and then ended up becoming her one of her personal bodyguards. They then fell in love. And Put they up moved, to my bumper, baby. They moved to New York City together um, where he was not only her lover but also her bodyguard. So it's like the Kevin Costner Whitney Houston. <laughs> <laughs> they should remake it with those two. It's the canon version. <laughs> I want to see that so badly. The canon version. Grace Jones and Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> and I will always pull up to my bumper, baby. Pull up, pull up. Um, on the streets of New York City, to protect Grace, he always had two guns on him. One on his hip and one on his ankle. Fucking hell. Um, Dolph Lundgren, not only is he a, a ten-year veteran of karate championships, he, he's, a bodyguard he's got two to, guns. He's bodyguard to Grace Jones while he's pulling up to her bumper. But also... She doesn't need a bodyguard. If someone came up to her, I wouldn't want to... I wouldn't touch her. I wouldn't mess like, with her, man. Yeah, it's, I'd be scared. But Grace Jones in, in, uh, basically in, introduced him to lots of her friends. He became really good friends with Andy Warhol uh, and lots of other people like Roger Moore. And then eventually, when, they were, he, when he was on set of um, A View to a Kill, they said, oh, do you want to be in this? So his first on-screen appearance is in A View to a Kill, as a guy that gets killed by Roger Moore briefly. Oh, I think I maybe saw that. I watched it not too long ago. Well, because of that, he then got the role of Ivan Drago in Rocky IV. So, so pulling up to the bumper was a good move? It was a good move, because then he got Rocky IV, then he got Masters of the Universe, uh, and loads of little straight-to-video stuff, and then he did, like, the odd Dark Angel. Now he's, like, the the bona fide action hero legend you know who is probably a bit more straight to video than a lot of expendable action heroes yeah you know bring all of these back into the limelight indeed indeed and we'll get on to like action heroes in a moment we can have a brief chat about because we both love our action heroes um well let's talk about ivan drago shall we and uh what what he did to sylvester stallone i can't really comment to be honest with you i can't remember it well any of Sylvester, them, really. Stallone said in, in Rocky IV, um, I really want these fights to look real, so I want you to hit me as hard as you can, Dolph. And he was like, are you sure? He's like, yeah, yeah, hit me as hard as you can. But he hit Sylvester Stallone so hard in the ribs that he made his heart swell up, so he had to go into intensive care with a swollen heart. Why did he say hit me hard as you can? Because I want it to look good for the cameras. I'm, I'm Sylvester Stallone. I can take it. Oh, obviously couldn't. The doctor said, you've got the same injuries as somebody who get, gets in a car crash, Mr. Stallone. He's and that a, was... He's a big guy. So did they use the shot? Oh, yeah. It's in, all the shots are in there, yeah. Oh, good. Um... He said, Not they said to him, hurt, but... <clears throat> your injuries are exactly the same as someone involved in a very fast, very big car crash where the steering wheel hits you in the chest and breaks a few ribs and hits your heart so hard that a lot of people die from that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that was what a punch from Dolph Lundgren is like, basically. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. Um, he also managed... Um, a, an Olympic team in the 1996 Summer Olympics for real he did what he, man he managed a sports team in the 1996 Summer Olympics he managed them yeah he coached them coached them yeah <laughs> fair enough um, so he, he got asked to be involved in that for real 
which is weird. I um, presume as he gets older, I know obviously he is older than he was when you know when he was when he was younger. Obviously, um, that's how age and time works. Um, but like, I presume when he stops doing so much activity physically, he probably because of his brain. I imagine do maybe writing or. Do you know what I mean? Still go well, on to do achieve some stuff. He revealed only about two years ago that he's been battling cancer. Oh, um, I didn't realise. So he's come out the other end of that. Oh, OK. Um, so I think he is really stepping down from action as much as possible now. Right. Obviously, he's still showing up in the odd expendables or whatever. Um, but then another fact about Dolph is, and this will be one for me, it's my birthday episode, is he starred in the first R-rated Marvel movie, The Punisher, in 1989. I remember that film with him yeah. on Sky Movies. Yeah. Um, played Frank Castle years before, you know, Marvel was even really making movies, apart from the odd, terrible Spider-Man and Incredible Hulk TV show. But yeah, he, he played the Punisher, so people, you know, always remember that one. He also turned down the role in Ridley Scott, Scott's Gladiator. What, for Russell Crowe? Uh, he was going to be the, um, you know, the huge guy that Russell Crowe fights. I've not seen oh, it. You haven't seen it? Shit. Well, he was going to be, he, he was offered the role by Ridley Scott. But he said, no, I don't I don't want to be in this. I'm not interested in, in doing any acting at the moment. I want to take time out. So he, you've got to respect that the guy doesn't just go after the money. If he wants to take a few years off or a year off, he does. Yeah, fair enough. <clears throat> and if you notice, I'm quite a unmanly uh, person of my sports choices. I like skateboarding. Uh, you know, so that's why I haven't seen a lot of these movies or, you know, Top Guns and whatnot. <laughs> he wasn't in Top Gun. <laughs> Imagine if he was, he wouldn't fit in the plane. No, not. Um, my favourite story is one... So, I don't know if you've seen the movie he was in with Brandon Lee. Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Show yeah. down Little Tokyo. Yeah, yeah. So when they were on set... Good name were, for movie. Good name. While they were on set, they were overheard, and this is quite an interesting... And he's later repeated this conversation on, like, the Jay Leno and stuff like that. But basically, him and Brandon Lee were talking about real-life fights they'd got into. So Brandon Lee said he got home one day, and there was a man in his house robbing him. This is Brandon Lee, yeah. He said the guy was still in the bedroom. Thank me, this burglar. <laughs> That's why I wanted this to tell this burglar, story. This burglar's like, right, here we go. Nice, I'm in. Do you know what he's doing? Before you, before you say he anymore. Go, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. And he's looking around the house and he looks like he goes, fucking hell, look at that. It's a picture of Bruce Lee. Fucking hell, nice. There's another one. It's a bit weird, isn't it? He doesn't know. He's broken into Bruce Lee's son's house. <laughs> Bruce Lee. <laughs> Well, well, it's so amazing. You couldn't make it up. That's like a film in itself. What happened? Well, Brandon said he caught this guy holding his VCR in his hand. So he just, all he wanted was Brandon Lee's video player. Fuck me. He go, oh, oh, can you imagine? This is the movie bit where you have a close up of his eyes, both their eyes, and all of a sudden a close up of the picture of the Bruce Lee and the person Bruce Lee's with. And then it back to his eyes and back to Brandon Lee. Oh, he, no. Oh, I've made a mistake. <laughs> Well, Brandon, he said, um, they got into a fight and the man ended up getting a knife from Brandon, Lee's kitchen and going to stab Brandon, Lee. Wow. Brandon, he said, I Pop took the thing. knife. He said, I took the knife off of him. Cool. Just, just like that. It's not, I'm not even going to tell you anything more about and he that. Said, he said, the police came and took him away. When he got out of <laughs> hospital a few weeks later, <laughs> he got two years for breaking, entering and attempted robbery. So he put him in hospital for two weeks. I got beat up by Bruce Lee, son. <laughs> well, Dolph then replied with a story of his own. He said, well, I had a similar thing happen to me once, but I didn't have to fight anybody. When I was living in Spain, I got home one day. My wife, uh, well, my fiance at the time, was tied, tied up in the bedroom, and I couldn't understand what was going on. I undid her ropes and called the police and she said what had happened was a group of robbers had broken into their Spanish villa tied her up god knows what they were going to do to her and they were going to rob the place 
But then they saw loads of family photos that had her and Dolph Lundgren. Yes, like I was just saying. And it's exactly like you just said. And they instantly shat themselves and just left her there and ran off. So he didn't even need to do anything. Just had a pic- so, guys, what I'm saying is put up some pictures of Dolph Lundgren or Bruce oh, Lee. Photoshop, yes. that's it. This is good. Guys, guys, good burglary tips here. Keep, write this down. Photoshop oh. yourself with different people. You know. I've got that photo of me and Jackie Chan that I oh, sent you. Oh, yeah, Leslie Nielsen. <laughs> Leslie, no, <laughs> Leslie Nielsen. Do you mean Liam Neeson? <laughs> me and Leslie Nielsen hanging out on the set of Naked Gun. But, uh, but he did wrestle the bear bear bag. He did. Um, but I, I've got that photo of me and, Bre- of J- and Jackie Chan together, so maybe I should get that blown up a bit more and framed in my living room, so if anyone ever breaks in, they'll be like, oh, shit, this guy knows Jackie Chan. Wait, you can just Photoshop it. I mean, that's brilliant. But I love the fact that that's another movie just there. Oi, Fred, what? Look at this. What? That woman we got tied up down there. Look at that picture. What? It's fucking that guy in there. What? It's that guy who fought Rocky. What? What are you on about? Look. Dolph Lundgren. Yeah, that's him. Look, and there's another one. What do you reckon? Oh, fuck. And then just that, the, the alarm bell's ringing. Like, quick, out, now. Go. Don't yeah. even untie her. Go. Dolph Lundgren. We're in Dolph Lundgren's house. Yeah. Get out. Well, I'd still feel more sorry for the guy that was gripping onto a VCR and then hear someone come in and thinks, oh, fuck, the owner of the home's come home and Brandon Lee walks in. Oh, <laughs> Just no. Think, oh, of, of all the fucking people. It's, like, it's the first day of me in my robbing career. <laughs> not doing it ever again i'm getting put in hospital for two weeks um last couple of bits he's done loads of for charity um he's a very charitable man and he also like i said he overcame cancer recently and he is an incredibly talented got one of the highest grades you can get in music in drumming he's a really talented drummer um, i want to start a band with dolph well he put Called he it in the a, dolphins have you ever seen have you ever seen a movie uh where he plays the, the drummer for like a britney spears type character it's like die hard but a music theater, um, music festival <laughs> what and he saves the day yeah basically he's like a drummer for this sort of pop star as she's going on tour and then she gets taken hostage by all these sort of hans gruber type men but they don't know he's like an ex-military badass that just now drums for britney spears yeah. and he goes around taking them all out even with his drumsticks he stabs one of them it's i can't remember what it's called now um kick snare or hi-hat or it's got a name like that but it's very very good all right drum roll i don't know something like that that's pretty cool but yeah um Anyway, we could go on and on about Dolph, but he's definitely made his way into the um, the legend, Hall of Legends, hasn't he, for, as far as action heroes go? Yeah, yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, he's, he's, I, I assume he's a pretty nice guy, actually. He seems all right. Yeah. Um, you know, nicer than some, Seagal, looking at you. Um, yeah, yeah, in comparison, yeah, Seagal looks, comes across very bad, I imagine. Yeah, but I, I've always thought of Dolph in my probably in my top five. Really, you know, you have got what, your Van Dams, your Schwarzenegger, Stallone. What's Steve Seagal's IQ? Can you quickly look it up? <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> this is not something I thought I'd ever have to look up. I don't know though if he would tell the truth anyway. I'd imagine he'd make it up and change it to something else. Uh, let's have a look. But would we actually know? Would it be actually correct? Who's saying it? You know. If you type in "Is Steven Seagal," one of the first things that comes up says, "Is Steven Seagal a god?" <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell! Who's we googling could, we, that? We should start a new podcast where we just do this. Oh, Steven Seagal says. Oh, well, okay, so that. so all right, so we take it down by twenty. What does he say? <laughs> He says, I've got the highest IQ in the world. <laughs> literally, literally says that. Really? Oh, come on, Stephen. Do you really think you've got the highest IQ in the world? But there's no proof of that. Okay. Uh, all right, well, let's forget that. Let's, let's Steve- assume it's less. If he was still alive, Stephen Hawkins versus Stephen Seagal in a game of chess. Let's see what goes on. My money's on Hawkins all the way. Stephen <laughs> Seagal. Oh, I was just blocking, just 
trying to push the yeah, but if Stephen Hawking body, out of the way. Body doubles every five seconds. Oh. It wouldn't even be him. Oh. You know. Anyway, that was very good. Thank you for that. No problem. I, I, I'm sure the listeners and myself are all needs to know about some Dolph, Dolphin, Lundgren. Yeah. If you don't know Dolph Lundgren, go and check down. Check, check down. Go and check down. Go and check. <laughs> go da- and check out. Get some down with Dan slang. His street um, words. But the word of the strange segment is ended because the Bill's wearing his He-Man costume. Yeah, but it's She-Ra, isn't it? I don't know what is going on, but he's forgot to put the pants on. <laughs> That hairy loincloth is not a hairy loincloth. That's not very good. <laughs> all right, Bill, take us out of here. That's all the time we've got for this week on World Was Strange. Next week, though, give me Ira. Hairless pets. Weird. At the far end of the universe, there is a planet ruled by a being of utter evil. <laughs> And there is only one man who dares challenge him. They are locked in a battle to the death. A battle that will take them across the heavens. Stop him! A battle that will finally be fought. I want them to get down and brought to me! Across the face. Police! Nobody move! Of Earth. I think I'm going to need some backup. Can you show us the way? No. distant galaxy, they have come to Earth. Dolph Lundgren as He-Man, Frank Langella as Skeletor. Only they have the powers to be. Masters of the Universe, live the adventure. Okay, so that was the trailer for the epic Masters of the Universe from 1987. My dreams have all come true. We're talking about this on the podcast after 10 years. Um, So here's the synopsis. The heroic warrior He-Man battles against the evil Lord Skeletor and his armies of darkness for control of Castle Greyskull. As if you needed to know. As if you needed to know what was going on. <laughs> what you do need to know, though, is that we won't talk about the director too much, Gary Goddard, because he did some pretty questionable things potentially with underage people. So let's skip what? that. Yeah, let's skip that. No, bit. you can't skip that. Well, that's all I, I know really what? is that he doesn't direct anymore because there were about ten years ago there were some allegations. Uh, what on the set of this film, or not on the set of this film, though? No. <clears throat> oh but, shit! Yeah, well, I don't know about that. Oh, well, I don't think it was very well directed. So there you go. But um, this is a Canon film. Canon Studios. Uh, yes, indeed. This um, is the it was, film. It was a big budget movie for them, wasn't it? It, Yes and no. They pulled the budget about two weeks before the end. Right. So that's oh, why yeah. the end of the film doesn't really... That, that battle he has with Skeletor is so weirdly shot and lit because they were, they, they basically took the set down they took the set away from them while they were still filming it. Um, because basically what I was going to say was this is the movie that ended Canon Studios. This and Superman 4, which they were shooting around the same time. Um, and the plan with Canon was they were doing so well with all yeah, their ninja but, movies and everything. But it was a, a sort of a Blumhouse type sort of thing, isn't it, really, back in the day? It's like you get these certain studios and Canon was... A great studio, but they were making lots, weren't they? So, so you'd get different degrees, but occasionally they'd get hits. Yeah, like, Co- like Blumhouse was early on. Was it, well, yeah. still is essentially. But what happened was they were gonna. They had the rights to make a Spider-Man film, Canon. So they were like, "Great, Spider-Man is a well-known superhero. What we can do is we can make a Spider-Man film, but we need to do that by we need to get two big." blockbusters under our belt and that the money so the money from masters of the universe and the money from superman 4 both of those are surefire hits 
And when they make all their money, we're then going to go and make Spider-Man. And it was going to be James Cameron directing it. Um, I think he might have been involved in the, some of the scripting on it as well. But Canon was pissing money away. As you've just said, they were making so many films, they kind of ran out of money. So when when Superman 4 flopped, and then when this was getting towards the end of being made... They pulled the plug on Masters of the Universe. They couldn't do any of the things they wanted to do to wrap the film up. So the, the last battle between ba- between He-Man and Skeletor is just, there's no background. There's no scenes. It's just all in a dark room. You know, there's a bit of money spent on the CGI lightning and stuff like that. But it just all ended, really. And in fact, they kept pulling the budget on it, which is why it takes place on Earth rather than on the planet Eternia. You know, it's why you don't get a battle cat and you don't get many of the characters you know from the cartoons and the toys because canon had bitten off more than they can chew. So this film, Masters of the Universe and um, Superman 4, were two of the last films canon made. Mm. Um, They already had a sequel lined up to this, which they ended up recycling the script for and turning it into Cyborg with Jean-Claude Van Damme. Right. Um, Using the sets that they'd already started building the sets for... Masters of the Universe 2, they thought that they were just always going to win, 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 win. But yeah, but if they're just hemorrhaging money... And that's the thing. They were making millions of ninja films well, and breakdancing well, both, films. Were well, both films in production at the same time? Superman uh, around, I think around about the same time, yeah. <sighs> Christopher Reeve didn't want to do Superman 4. You know, the, the, the budget was ridiculous yeah. bad on that. If you've watched it recently, it's an awful film. No. Um, the, the, the effects are terrible. The same with this. I don't know. know. I've ever seen it, to be honest with you. The suit, even the suit he wears in Superman 4 is awful compared to the suits he's wearing. Yeah, in who the is it? Is it Christopher Reeve? Yeah, yeah, it's Christopher Reeve. Right. <clears throat> but it's just awful. Um, yeah, they, they were just pissing money away, really. But this film is what it is. Now, look, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it was a flop. It's, it, yeah, it, it's 5.4 out of 10. I, um, when I saw it as a kid... Um, obviously, I was a Star. Obviously, I was a Star Wars fan. Obviously, I was a Master of the Universe fan. But I think more of a Star Wars fan. Obviously, like bigger. Not obviously, but I was. Um, yeah. I had a lot more of their stuff than I did. But I did have Battle Cat. And I had a few of the toys in that. Um, and I used to. What would it be then? Cartoon was that cartoon? Of the the cartoon was what most people knew. It was also comic. I think um, cartoon, and the toys. I think I knew cartoon um, really. So when this movie came out, though, it was exciting, and I I might have even seen it in the cinema. Um, but I think this was almost like my second or third time watching it for this. Um, and when it came out, though, for whatever reason, even as a kid, I was quite underwhelmed by it. It didn't it didn't hit the hit the stuff that I wanted. And <laughs> and the person who was he man at the time, because I wasn't really probably that sure, because it's quite early on. I think I felt, was, well, I think Dolph, it's because the way he is, is, unfortunately, I think it could have been someone else. His acting so lacklustre, even though it's not even just audibly. I know you say what he says, cutting the order. It is very, like, just, I should do that. Yeah. It's really flat. Yeah. And uh, it's a shame. And uh, if it was different, someone else playing it. <clears throat> but I know it's not. He Man, the movie's called Masters of the Universe, so it's going to be all the characters, so it's not. But at the same time, He Man was the main motherfucker. So, the other problem with this film is it came too late. Um, oh, right, now, yeah. So, but, so what, He Man came out. What year was it? 87. <clears throat> so, He Man, the cartoon, mm. hit the UK in 1983. Yeah. The same time as the toys hit the UK in 1983. So, I was five years old. <clears throat> I got. Council Grey School for Christmas, probably that year or maybe 84. And at one point, it was the hottest selling toy line in history. You know, Mattel were making billions on an annual basis from this toy line alone, which is why they then got the cartoon up and running not long after the toys had started coming out. Like I said, they both they both hit the UK around about the same year. And it did amazing then She-Ra came out, and that was doing amazing. It just added to it. There was two cartoons you could watch then, you know, two toy lines. And then around about 85, 86, 
kids had grown up who had the He-Man toys and they can't watch the cartoon and they were starting to move into Transformers later down the line, the real Ghostbusters. And they'd lost Ninja its Turtles. Uh, core original audience. So by the time this came out, the toys just weren't selling anymore. I, I've got And to, the cartoon had stopped. Yeah, looking back on it, because I was a kid at that time, so I was the actual demographic. You, you were 10 when this came out. Yeah, I was a demograph. So all these toys coming out, all these things, we were, we were like, because they're still properties being used now, Transformers movies, etc., etc. Ninja Army Turtles. Turtles yeah. yep. uh, still going now. Even G.I. Joe is still getting. But you know, we had them stuff. fresh then. And there's always, like, some new toy range come in. So, <clears throat> yeah, things would get pushed and come in and go, you yeah. know. Um, Thundercats, Mask, you know, all these things. <clears throat> yeah, but, um, absolutely. But, so that's another flaw for this one. Now, for the kids watching this, aged between, like, 5 and 10, 99% of those kids, me being one of them, loved this. I knew... Okay, well, Battle Cat's not in this. He Man and Skeletor look a bit different. They're on Earth, but there's a reason they're on Earth. They've come to Earth, blah, blah, blah. I went with it. <clears throat> Obviously, they're adults, the critics, because it's not kids that critique films, it's, it's adults. They were like, this is awful. The acting's awful. Some of the effects are okay. You know, Dolph Lundgren can't act. Everybody in this is terrible. Why, it's nothing like the cartoon or the toys. And it got completely panned got you know it's a turkey it almost made Dolph Lundgren give up on Hollywood Stallone as you said visited the set and poked fun at him because he had lines he was told he wasn't going to have lines he was told they were going to dub over him someone whose whose English and accent was a bit less um but they ended up not having enough money again to do that um and he he now looks back on it fondly, but for about 20 years of his career, he hated the fact he was He-Man and he played a toy. Whereas He doesn't wear much clothing. Whereas Frank Langella, <clears throat> who plays Skeletor, his highlight of his career, weirdly, and he's an Oscar-winning actor. Oh, he loves it, doesn't he? He loved playing Skeletor. He said... I did it because my kids had all the toys and they said, Dad, if you've got the chance, you've got to be him. So he went and played Skeletor and he puts everything... And everybody says, no matter what you say about this film, yeah, yeah, yeah. Skeletor is awesome. In yeah, this. yeah, I agree. The, the, yeah. the visual Great delivery. effects of his... The, the, yeah, his delivery. I don't know, the mask is a bit sketchy. What they've also done as an adult, you realise what they're doing with this film is they're really cashing in on Star Wars. Star Wars obviously made a lot of money from those three movies. By the time yeah. this had come out, they were trying to cash in on, you know, Star Wars spaceships. There's even quite a bit of Darth Vadery the way but, Skeletor is. But, but, we're, but they're like four years too late. Exactly. You know, they were too late again. So this film was too little too late, sadly. Um, uh, I was chatting to our buddy RJ McCready about this. Um, yesterday and he said he used to live opposite a cinema and um he remembers seeing the the posters up and thinking well there's no way that that's not going to be a surefire hit and he couldn't understand why everyone was saying it was awful awful film but as an adult when you watch it through adult eyes you understand that however i watch this film at least once a year um you know i love he-man so much um it's a huge you're, part you're of my pushed childhood. through yeah and and i <laughs> I actually love the flaws that are in this film and the city delivery and some of the mistakes even. Yeah, you know. it is, it's, it's transferred into your DNA. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, it's a part of you. you. You enjoy everything about this movie, even if it is shit or bad or good or whatever, you like it. And the I, fact that it's a canon film, it just adds to it, you know. I, I thought, how cool would it be if John Carpenter had directed it? Jesus Christ. Imagine him directing Skeletor. Think like Big Trouble Little China, sort of around that era, but he just had a chance to do this with maybe, obviously, bigger budget. But John Cobb to direct it. Be amazing. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Be amazing. Well, obviously, it'd the be sequel... Kurt Russell, though, wouldn't it? Was he, man? Oh, my God. <laughs> obviously, the sequel never went ahead. As I said, they recycled the script and made that cyborg movie with Van Damme, which was one of Van Damme's first movies. It was a canon film. Um, he'd done blood sport and kickboxing. kickboxing but how did as well. they do that after the, the canon had flopped? Well, they were still they still had a few films to make, but they were shutting down, really. You know, right. they, they poured everything they had into Superman for the quest for peace and Masters of the Universe. And... Neither of them made anything like what they cost to try and make. So 
they were already and I think the brothers the Globe and, and Golos I think they they had fallen out as well and I think it was all just going to shit really um, so this was the de- start of the decline of canon they probably shut their doors a couple of years after probably 90 early 90s and that was the end really for them however you know there are some good takeaways from this movie before we get into it like I said Dolph Lundgren yeah okay He's the only guy that could have played E-Man at the time. Frank Langell is incredible in it. Meg Foster is in this. You know, talking to John Carpenter, Meg Foster is in this as Evil Lynn, and she's incredible in it. Um, I, sh- I think she's really scary. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't know that. That was her real eyes. What's Meg um, Foster done with John Carpenter? Uh, she, is she not in John Carpenter films? I'm pretty sure she is, isn't she? Mm, don't think maybe, so. Maybe not, actually. Maybe yeah, you might be right, but she's you know she's horror. She's been in horror stuff. Yeah. Um, oh, I oh yeah, yeah, she's a staple of horror. I didn't know they were her real eyes. Um, yeah, 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 it's crazy, really. Uh, <laughs> Courtney Cox first film. I didn't really know it's her real naked body in uh, Lords of Salem either. Yeah, that's her. I thought it was a uh, bodysuit sort of thing. Um, we've also got Billy Barty in this as Gwildor. Gwildor. Um. And some good effects around that. Um, James Tolkien plays Lubick, who was in Back to the Future as Strickland, Principal Strickland. And he's great in this. He's a lot of people's favourite character in this. Um, uh, 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 yeah, it's weird. We've also got you another You can imagine char- him as like in some sort of 80s perv movie as well, though. As oh, that little yeah. character. Um, as well as Courtney Cox, we've also got another cast of friends in this. Um, her mum in... Um, friends Christina Pickles also plays the sorceress in this um, so we've got two friends references in this um, <clears throat> is that the one that plays um, uh, Max Mum in uh, uh, The Sunny in Philadelphia I uh, don't think so no she she's Monica's and Ross's mum's in, in Friends ok I might be thinking something else oh, there's another movie I watched the other day where they popped up probably them Okay. And the other the other person to mention in this really is um, Anthony DeLongis, who plays Blade in this. Not the vampire hunter, um, but he plays a character called Blade. Um, and he is Hollywood royalty because any time you ever see somebody using a whip or swords in films, he's usually had something to do with it. He's the guy that taught Harrison Ford how to whip, Michelle Pfeiffer how to whip. Good. Yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer in Cat as Catwoman. He also talked Dolph Lundgren how to hold the giant sword he had to use as He-Man. And this guy's got over 200 credits on, I- on IMDb. He's an actor, fight choreographer, stuntman, and he's a whip. He's, one of his titles is Whip Master, Gav. Wow. That, that used to be your title, didn't it? So to say down the pub? I'm a whip master. Whoosh. Effects are pretty good in this. For the most part. But let's talk about it. Let's get into it. We, A lot of you will know this story. Some of you may have even heard me talk about this on other podcasts. I think this is the third time we've discussed it. I love it. And it's fun. It's a silly, it's a silly movie. You love it. Fucking get on with it. I do. Okay, well, even the titles after the Canon logo, it's Superman. The music sounds like a Superman song, but slightly off-key. Um, and... The, even the titles sort of zoom into the screen like the Superman titles do. It, it does feel like the end of a Star Wars uh, movie, the, the the original trilogy. Um, the music is quite epically, you know, orchestrated. And another little caveat quickly is um, you won't really see anybody from the toys or the cartoons in this other than Beast Man, Teela, Man of Times and He-Man and Skeletor, obviously. Because, weirdly, there was a, a weird pushback from Mattel that made the toys and Filmation that made the cartoon. They didn't want a lot of the characters to appear in this film. And they also said He-Man's not allowed to kill anybody in this film. So all the baddies in it are apparently robots, all of Skeletor's sort of troopers are robots. That's how He-Man can get away with chopping them all up with his sword. So there's a lot of restrictions on this. So go ahead and make He-Man but do it this way. Oh, that's a Hollywood boy. Crazy. In the 80s as well. Uh, uh, and it starts off with his these people in black costumes and loads of like guards and it feels very Star Wars it, it feels, does doesn't it it really feels like Star Wars which is 
a, if that's their intention, that's a weird thing. I don't think it is, but it's possibly a very good influence, or maybe just it's a bank for the money. Oh, let's put that in there because it, you know Star Wars is popular. Oh no, they they wanted to cash in on that definitely. I okay. think you know yeah, they're trying every, any way they can. I think, and it just I don't know, it's fine, but it just makes you think Star Wars. But like you said, I think yeah, it just wouldn't hit at that time. He Man had already started dying off. Well, Star Wars was long gone. There's so many cool things coming and going so quickly. So many like incredible stuff we we had. We don't even appreciate. It. I even think about it now. Like wow, like this thing. Then the next month's this. Oh, this is coming. Oh my god! And it's just always oh, new things all the time. BMXs, VCRs, just continue, continue. Game Boy, it's just everything. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, you're right, I probably just did not hit the right time. No. Well, like you say, we start off on this other planet called Eternia, which is uh, the, the planet of He-Man, and it's war-torn, and Skeletor is, you know, he's taking it all the, the planet hostage, he's killing people, and he's even broken into Castle Greyskull. Naughty boy. Uh, naughty, naughty boy. And he says, I want He-Man captured, uh, and I want Gwildor found. And we find out later on who, who Gwildor is, but he's the guy that invents the cosmic key that can travel through space and time with his cosmic key. We also get to see Evil Lynn, who says, yeah, don't worry, we've got um, the sorceress captured, and we're draining her power. When, when do you reckon they uh, decided to coin the rest of the name Evil to Lynn? <clears throat> She's just Lynn. That's Lynn. Who's that? That's Lynn. Well, all of He-Man's characters are, na- are sort of puns, because her name's like Evelyn. But she's evil in, you know. So they've all got names like Mechanic is Mechanic. But are they, but are they <clears throat> on the bad side? Are they calling her uh, evil in? Uh, they normally just call her Lynn. Sometimes they call okay, her evil Lynn. Skeletal Lynn. calls her Lynn quite a lot. Hey, Lynn, I love it. It's just Lynn. Right, most, Lynn. People, most people refer to her as evil Lynn, but I used to work in a cafe with a woman called Lynn. Was she evil? Ah, she's quite nice. Not she was good, Lynn then. Yeah, she's all right, yeah. Nice, nice Lynn. Yeah, nice Lynn. Yeah, she's all right. Nice Lynn in the cafe. Yeah. Well, Sorceress has been captured. The worst thing that can happen, Skeletor's taken Castle Grayskull. He's got the Sorceress captured, and he's put out a hit on He-Man and this Gwildor character. Um, and he then does a big hologram of himself to the entire planet. Because they didn't have phones on Eternia, or the internet back then so he does a big hologram of himself saying he man needs to hand himself into me by uh the seventh moon of pluto or whatever it is that they, they the sort of time scales that they use otherwise i'm taking the castle and it's all going to be mine ha, 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 ha. and he man sees this and he stands there heroically on the top of this this cliff and we know that this is going to be an epic film don't we <laughs> from this point we just know like the first 20 minutes of this you're like fucking hell and then the, you can see where the budget just starts getting sucked out from it. Yeah, and so, I love so, this movie. So, <laughs> so they didn't film the ending first, then they they started filming. Yeah, they didn't film the ending first. Though. Should have filmed the ending first. I know. Um, now the troops, then Skeletor's evil troops, who are robots. Don't worry, that's how they get away with being killed. They capture Gwildor in a net, and again, it's very Star Wars, isn't it? It's like the Jawas or yeah, something. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they, they, he's a locksmith slash inventor, apparently. Um, so uh, um, he he basically shows He Man and Man at Arms and Teela who show up why he's hunted by Skeletor. He's a locksmith. He's a, an inventor, and he's got this thing called the Cosmic Key that can open a portal to anywhere in the galaxy any time i didn't realize that's man of arms and I thought, oh yeah i f- imagine it now yeah, yeah man of arms and his daughter Tila. I, didn't, I didn't realize what is his what's his daughter there what's going on then with that oh that, that's that's they're just father and daughter that's how they were in the comics and in the cartoons yeah, but why is she hanging out what, what's she doing oh uh, she's captain of the guard captain of what god the attorney and guard what's that then? so he is the master of all weapons and he's the like he's, a, he's a master armorer. Yeah, and she is captain of Man the castle. So she's basically in charge of the entire Eternian royal palace and, and all the guards. She's a badass warrior woman. Right. And she's also, like head of security. Also one of my first crushes. Did you did you 
Knocked no. one out. No. Then no. you. No, didn't. So she's she's like head of security. Yeah, yeah, if you go back and watch the cartoons, you see that no, she, oh, she's now? high then, up. Then she ra was a, a princess in the yeah, castle, well, and He Man's a prince in the castle. Well, they're twins. He Man and She were twins. So who's brothers. the king? King Randor. What's going on there then? Nothing. Has he got powers? No. But his wife is from Earth. Where's so, he from then? Oh, that, he, oh, he's right, from yeah. Eternia. So, so uh, where do they get their powers from? Well, they're the chosen. They're the twins of power. So here's your backstory. So basically, um, Queen Marlena, or Marlena as she was known, mm-hmm. she was a, a pilot from Earth in NASA. And one day her spaceship gets sucked into a wormhole, crash lands in another galaxy, another dimension on Eternia. She is rescued by King Randall. And is impregnated by Randy they, Randall. They they get it on. They fall in love. Because ones they're from different galaxies, it's all the planets aligned. Da, 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 da. Twins of power are born. she is taken away by Hordak and onto another dimension on the planet of Etheria. And He-Man is brought up, you know, as Prince Adam. And then he finds out he's destined to become... Sorry, there's a moth. He's destined to become um, He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Meanwhile, She-Ra realizes she's destined to become She-Ra, Princess of Power. And then, hence, you get two cartoons and a crossover when they move into each other's dimensions. This was uh, the MCU before the MCU. Hmm. Right. All the while, Teela is captain of the guard her dad is man but teela is destined to one day become sorceress because she doesn't know who her real mother is her real mother is the sorceress who's that then the woman the bird woman who's caught in by skeletor she's she's the woman who lives in castle grayskull and turns into a bird occasionally and gives he-man invaluable advice she's one of the most powerful magical beings on eternia oh, i don't remember her She's simple. She's the one I've just told you about. She's Ross and Rachel's mum. <laughs> oh, okay. She's the one who's trapped, going here, man. Yeah, You're yeah. My power. That's the sorceress. She's she's got orange clothes in the cartoon now. Oh yeah. Now now I'm thinking about the movie. Yeah, I was going back to the cartoon. I, my head, everything you've been telling me, I was in, I was in cartoon world. Sorry, so yeah. I was pretty much in cartoon mode. So don't worry, we were on the same track. Obviously, we're doing she right now. So yeah. But yeah. now you say yeah in the movie. Yes, I remember her. I'm not I'm not having a, a special moment. That's fine. So there we go. You happy with the backstory on these characters? I'm, I'm happy. <laughs> this is my specialist subject, so I'm happy to talk about this. No, I'm happy, and I wanted to know. So you, you've, in, in, you know, you've given us that valuable information, and all the listeners are happy right now, aren't you, listeners? I hope so. So He-Man, Teela, and Man at Arms have rescued Gwildor. They've seen that he's got this cosmic key. He tells them, I made this cosmic key... Um, I showed it to Skeletor. I was tricked by Evil Lynn, and I showed it to them, and they've now got the other one. I only made two of them, and t- the two are linked. They can trace each other, uh, and they've got the other one, and that's how they got into Castle Grayskull, because they opened a portal which took them inside Castle Grayskull. Uh, and it's kind of my fault, so I'm a bit sorry about that, but I'll help you, you know, to get the, get, get it back, and we'll, maybe we'll all defeat Skeletor. And they're like, all right, thanks, little three-foot creature with big ears right. i'm sure you, I'm sure you'll be great at a fight with us but um it's obviously roll him like a ball just roll him at them like a bowling ball brilliant <laughs> um i reckon so, he's a pervert though so they managed to yeah oh yeah definitely he's got gills he blows water out of his gills all over Attila later she's like <laughs> oh. don't L- blow your gills all over me little fucking gill blower um, so they use his cosmic key to enter Castle Grayskull, and this is where they see the sorceress trapped in an energy shield. Yeah. And they realise she's been drained of all of her power. But Evil Lynn and Skeletor enter, and uh, he man says, "Let her go." <laughs> this is one of the deliveries you love. Let her go, and Skeletor says, "No, he man, surrender to me." Uh, there's a big laser battle that goes on here. Um, Gwildor says we have to escape it's the only thing we can do don't worry we've got about a week if we run away I can make us come back but we have to escape through my portal oh oh I'm just imagining the uh, acting delivered working alongside that with good little go and just being like oh my god and just having to respond to that 
Yeah, because you've got Frank Langella there. He's like in a Shakespearean actor. <laughs> One extreme to the other. And he's got full full skull makeup on. I'm loving this. <laughs> There's even a scene later on, which I still think is one of the greatest comic book sort of movie moments, where he says, tell me about the loneliness of good, He-Man. Is it as much as the loneliness of evil? And he's sort of saying, you know, we're the same person, you know, I'm the most evil person in the world, you're the most purest person in the world, but we've, neither of us have really got any friends or family. It's amazing delivery from Frank Langella. All the way through this, he's just having so much fun, you can tell. Uh, it's chewing scenery. He really is. He really is. Anyway, they they escape through a portal, uh, and he says, where are we going, Gwild? And he goes, anywhere. Where are they going, Gav? They're going to Earth, aren't they? Yeah. So they jump through the portal, and Skeletor says, find them, find them. And one of his troops says, well, the next time they use the, the cosmic key, we'll lock on to the signal. We'll know exactly where they are, like a GPS. And wherever they are in the galaxy, we'll go there for our portal and we'll catch them. So they're keeping an eye on the screens now, hoping that they reuse this cosmic key at some point. And they land on Earth. Oh boy, we're not going to turn it anymore. The budget's been cut again. <laughs> Can't afford to film this in a, another galaxy far away. This isn't a Lucasfilm. It, it does, because there's at one point when it just seems to be in a music store for a lot. Yes. It's like, why is it in this music store so much? This film takes place mainly in a high school, um, a music shop, and a street that they just bought one street. And, and they I, just. And unfortunately, I think it was the, the, the music studio, uh, the store, uh, which is where I was like, Char oh, Charlie's. There's a problem here. Do you know what I mean? It was first evident, then it just kind of went, it's stuck now. And I was like, oh no. Yeah. Well,. Like I said, they, they they were working with like an ever decreasing budget, bless them. But yeah. they land on Earth. Um, they, don't they, know where they, they did it. They did it. Yeah. They don't know where the hell they are. They're on Earth. Um, Gwildo lands in the water. <laughs> he clears his gills all over Teela's breasts, like we say. Um, they will laugh at that moment as well. I bet they do. If I was Man at Arms, I'd be like, "Don't you ever do that to my daughter again." Dirty little locksmith. Are you thinking about jizz? What? <laughs> Don't think about jizz in my daughter. They, they realise they've lost their... <laughs> Jesus Christ, I never thought we'd get to this on the Masters of the Universe. <laughs> uh, they realise they've lost the cosmic key. So they they form a perimeter, search the perimeter. They meet a cow. What's this strange being? <laughs> Like, is it intelligent? It is kind of fun. Them being on Earth and that going on with the little fella and the cow is kind of fun. The little fella. <laughs> is that his name? The little, the little fella. fella, yeah. Um, what I like, this bit that always makes me laugh still to this day is when the cow goes, Moo, and Guido goes, what a hideous cry. What a hideous cry. Yeah. It's just, it's just saying moo. But I love it. Obviously, they don't know what a cow is. So they split up. And of course, this is the first time we hear them say, good journey so they don't say goodbye or see you later because they're from Eternia they say good journey good journey now I must quickly on a side note say the best viewing I've ever had of this about eight or nine years ago they did an outdoor screening of this in one of the parks in my home city there was about 200 people there some of them dressed up as He-Man or she or Skeletor they were given out inflatable swords I went along with my mate Rob and his son um and a few other people I know that had children. We all had He-Man toys with us, and we watched this, and we were all repeating the lines, um, good journey. And when, when everyone left the park, when the film was finished, the guys on security were saying good journey to everyone, and we were saying good journey, good journey, good journey. It was brilliant. It's about one of the best viewings I've ever had of a film. It was a good journey. It was a good journey. <coughs> good. It's time to meet Julie, a.k.a. Courtney Cox, in her first film role. So she'd done a Tampax advert, then she was in a Bruce Springsteen music video. Next thing you know, she's in Masters of the Universe. And then, uh, um, obviously, a uh, uh, thingy with uh, the mask. <coughs> no, that's... That's Cameron Diaz. Diaz. What did she do next? Oh, she did Leprechaun. No, that's Jennifer. You're getting your uh, white women muddled up there, Gav. Yeah, I am. <laughs> they all look the same. They do. Um, she works in a burger, burger joint. But it's her last shift because she is moving away because her parents died last year. And she's been so sad. 
she's decided I'm going to dump my boyfriend and move to another city. Yeah, he doesn't know that yet. She's going to use him, I think, for a ride first. Oh, no, she, he knows. Oh, yeah, no, he does, that's right. Yeah. That's right. He's being a gentleman. Yeah. So he picks her up. Well, he's going to try and still get back in there. That's what he's doing. For one last, you know. Well, I was meaning a relationship, now, now, but... Now, 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 yeah, he's got the van. Yeah, he's got the van, and he's, got, he's a musical man as well. Is that the, the, the difference guitar? No, it was supposed to be friends. I was wondering what was going to happen in that van. Now, 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 now. Just going to play some music for your ride there. So no one told you life was going to be this way. Now, 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 now. Your mouth's so pretty and I don't know what to say. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so her boyfriend, Kevin, as we say, he picks her up and he's very sad. He says, are you sure you're going to get this plane tomorrow? And fly away from me. She's like, yeah, it's just the only way I can be happy. What, leave everything behind? I guess. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, if you're young. I guess. So he says, all right, well, look, do you want to come to my sound check? She's like, yeah, all right, I'll come to your sound check. Cause your band are playing at the high school dance tonight. All right, cool, cool. And then she says, oh, can we quickly go to the cemetery so I can say goodbye to my parents? It's all the expositions in this little scene here. So that's our humans. Let's go back to our Eternians. So Teela, she closes in on Robbie's ribs, which is where Julie was working. She finds her dad, man at arms, and he's, uh, he says, I'm, a, I'm always hungry as a soldier. And she says, you're always hungry. He says, I lasted the siege of whatever it is for 30 days without food. Man at arms uh, does look a little bit like Robocop's granddad or Robocop's dad. <laughs> yeah, his visor is a bit weird, isn't it? Yeah, it's literally Robo- Robocop's dad. Ro- Robopops. Robo pop. <laughs> Dead or alive, you're coming with me. You're grounded. Go to your room. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> I found porn under your mattress. I swear, Dad, it was not mine. That's a bit of a weird sitcom. For the Robo family. Uh, Ro- Robo cop and Robo pop. Cop yeah. and pop. And Robo mom's there in an apron. I can picture her now. She's got an apron on her. She's like. These brownies are ready. But she's uh, then you got the the young daughter, but she's eighteen. And then their cousin R two D two comes round. Yeah, it'd be no, it'd be like the monsters. They've got a daughter, but she's a human. Yeah, that's it. It, <laughs> it could work. Let's AI that someone do it. Last time it was the A team sitcom. This time it's the Robocop sitcom. I love so. it. Love it. Back to back on Friday nights. Um, so. Yes, Teela and Man at Arms, very hungry. They spy Gwildor hiding in the bushes. And he's, it's he's got a little a... fucking hook, so it's like really <laughs> grabbing chicken out of a bucket. He's got a big old bucket grabs of chicken. grabs the whole bucket. <clears throat> so they all sit in the woods and eat this, yeah, this chicken. They're like, what are you doing here? And they're like, give me that chicken. And they eat some little side in the bucket of chicken. And then Teela says, why do they put the food on these little white sticks? And her dad says, well, these are ribs. And she's Obviously, disgusted. Yeah, she's like, you eat animals? And he goes, well, sometimes when you're at war and you've got to eat whatever's around. So maybe on their planet, they're mainly vegetarian. I guess so. Yeah, interesting. Um, <clears throat> Julie, it turns out, Courtney Cox, blames herself for her parents' death because they died in a plane crash. They had a private plane, a little mini micro plane. And the day that they were supposed to go on holiday... She decided, oh, I want to study. I'm a good student and I don't want to go on holiday. So they said, oh, well, in that case, we'll go up on our own. And uh, they died in that plane crash. So she blames herself as part of her depression. So while they're walking through the cemetery, though, what do they find in a crater in the ground, Gav? Um, they find the key. The cosmic key. And he's like, what is this? Now, my first note here is she picks it up. Yeah, it looks it, like a fucking bomb. It does. It it's got does. all these flashing lights and smoke coming off of it. Yeah. And she's like, oh, let me pick this up. I, I like to think with, with wisdom nowadays, people are wiser. <laughs> I'd be calling the police going, you probably with need to age. send the bomb squad out. Um, but instead, she picks it up. Then he says, oh, I know what this is. This is one of these new Japanese synthesizers. I, I love it. And then, then he starts playing. It's like, well, isn't that a coincidence? <laughs> But, but it plays music and you play the synth. Well, you know? he's a musician, Gavin. He knows an instrument it's when he sees synth one. He's a musician. He's a synth keyboard player. He knows what's going on. He presses the buttons and he sort of hears the weird noises. But because they're pressing the buttons, Skeletor picks up on the signal from it. 
and his troops like Skeletor we've located it you got to find my find my key it's turned on yeah find my key <laughs> Gwildor's brought it in but it's a vague because he doesn't really turn it on he just presses a few buttons they've got a vague location so they said it's enough of us for that next time whatever they press next time we'll definitely lock in to where it is so every time they use this thing it's giving sig- us more and more signals to Skeletor to find them they don't know that cut to the sound check this is like the um the the uh, oh you haven't you don't really like back to the future do you no not really okay there's this reminds me of the um high school dance in I, I know the, the film show. very well yeah well kevin's checking out you know and he's like how does that sound judy and she's like yeah yeah great typical like musician's girlfriend like yeah yeah great i've heard you play that a billion times and he's really up his up himself isn't he you can tell he thinks his band are going to be the next like huey lewis in the news or something you know yeah. but um i like kevin he's all right then he says to her <clears throat> i think what we're going to do now is i'm going to amp this uh Japanese synthesizer up, and I'm going to see what I can really do with this baby. Now, if I amp it up, Gav... Turn it to 11. Yeah, but all it does is he puts it to a microphone. I thought if you amp something, you plug it into the amps. You don't just put a microphone near it. Uh, Yeah, no, you are correct, yes. Oh, good, good. I got something right about music. But anyway, he plays it. This time, lights come out of it, and little spinning lights and special effects that probably cost... Too much money for Canon, and that's why the film got shut down. Um, unless he's just putting the microphone to it, then the, it was going, the microphone was going to an amplifier, and it was just coming out an amplifier. Yeah. It's not correct terminology, though, is it? Let's be honest. But anyway, because they've turned it on now and pressed some more buttons, Skeletal says, OK, we've located them. Assemble the mercenaries. That is what you would do. Sorry, I see you've thrown me on it now. You would do that because it's not going to have a fucking jack output to fucking or an XLR output to play it out of. Yeah. It's not a fucking music instrument. It's a fucking key from He-Man world. <laughs> so, uh, you know, uh, yeah, he's doing it correct. So Skeletor assembles the mercenaries, and these are the Beast Man. He should have said, let's mic it up. Mike, ah, that's what he should have said. There you go. Can we move away from this now? I wish I'd never brought it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can. You made me get obsessed. I right. should have known. Yep. So this is like the scene now where Darth Vader says, get the bounty hunters together, and you get Boba Fett, that lizard guy, that weird robot, and a few other ones. This is like that. Skeletor gets together his four best men. One of them is the Beast Man, who we all know from the cartoon Which and the I, comics. I always, I've always kind of like beast creatures, like werewolves or that sort of thing. I don't know why. He, he is terrifying. He Yeah, it, he was quite, I remember. I, I had cinema trauma. Um, yeah, as a kid, I remember thinking that. When he chases her through the school later. Um, Karg. Karg is that um, sort of Brian May hairdo creature. That's, I really dislike the look of that one. I don't like looking at it. Uh <laughs> Blade, uh, who's got a patch over his eye because He Man took his eye in a battle, and he's like, he's the guy that played by Anthony DeLongus, who is a, a real life man at arms. You know, that's what he's the one who whips He Man later in a very sexy fashion. Um, and he's got badass swords. And of course, Sawrod, who's like a lizard creature with a helmet on. And Skeletor says, hmm, what a curious quartet. Send them to the high school. Obviously, he doesn't call it a high school because Skeletor doesn't know what high school is. Uh, he says, but bring He-Man back alive. So they all jump through a portal and they end up in the high school. And Kevin says to Judy, I'm going to leave you alone now in the high school, if that's all right, because I'm so up my own arse and it's the last night of you being in, the, in town. But I'm going to go to my mate Charlie in his music store and get him to tell me how much this Japanese sympathizer is worth and what we can do with it. See you later. She's like, all right, I'll stay in the high school on my own. Well, it, 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 she said to him, I'm leaving. I, I don't want to be your boyfriend anymore. Girlfriend. Yeah. So he's like, yeah, fuck, nice. I'm found a synth. It's fucking well cool. I'll see you later. It is a pretty badass. I'd love to have it's, I, I can a get prop it. replica of that. Uh, yeah. Someone's probably get, made RJ, one. RJ, come on, you can make one. Yes. He can make one. For my 50th, If anyone RJ. can, RJ. Can. And I want it to do, not necessarily the lights, but if you can just get it to do the music. <laughs> that kind of thing, you know. There we go. Challenge. You've got four years to get that to me for my 50th. Go. Go. Start now. Go. 
Uh, so Kevin, um, like I said, he, he leaves, um, and the baddies arrive. Uh, Beastman smashes the janitor in the face, quite violent for a kid's film. Hmm. Hits him with an open palm in the face. Janitor goes flying through the wall. They chase Julie. She climbs under the stage. Um, Blade gets his swords out and starts stabbing them through the stage. She gets away. Yeah, it's then quite she, full on. she throws some bleach in uh, Beastman's face, and he's like, Rawr! and then the whole place catches on fire. She escapes, runs to the junkyard, and they chase her. Um, and this is where she bumps into Eman. Yeah, well, they're still in the they're still in the uh, place, aren't they? Oh no, they do get there. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and He Man looks like a, a a stripper, a male stripper. He does. He really does. I'm not even going to argue with you. He does. There's really, not much clothing going on. He's got on like a little metal bit on his chest with little some strings little straps and stuff. Yeah, it's and not a little much. pair of leather pants, and that's it. Yeah, I'd be falling out all over the place. <laughs> so. When she bumps into him in a dark junkyard in the middle of the night, she's not at all thinking, oh, this guy's a sex pest. What's he going to do to me? I know. She's like... She's happy to see this huge man who's all oiled up with n- he says, not he says, much clothes on. She says, help me. The monsters. Not even clothes. She says, these monsters are chasing me. And he just looks at her and goes, I can help you. Again. <laughs> terrible delivery. delivery. I can help you wait here and he hides her behind like a pile of metal and then he just goes to town on these troops now he takes them all out he fights beast man knocks him over then blade says i've waited a long time for this and they have a big old fight um he throws picks up saw rod and throws him at blade the lady at this point is sitting there on the floor watching all this after he man just been in her arms she must be going i am asleep <laughs> Absolutely, one hundred percent. There's no chance of me being awake. This is not happening. There's a, there's a, there's a one of those strippers, male strippers, just fighting creatures with a sword. Just fucking, I'm going to watch it, but I, I'll hopefully wake up soon. I think she, I've fallen asleep at the high school. She's thinking Kevin's still there. I've got so bored listening to his sound check. I've fallen asleep, and this is part of the dream. It must <laughs> yeah, be. It have to be. You would definitely be like this. Is a there's dream. no way. There's a big werewolf thing chasing me through the high school. Oh. But it's it's real, Gav. It's yeah. real. Um, so um, Man at Arms and Tila show up and shoot a few of them, and the bodies retreat, retreat. And then she cries, and then we get another fantastic line from London where he says, You're safe now. <laughs> and she is. She's safe. Let's go to Charlie's music store. Kevin arrives. Charlie's like, Hey, man, how you doing? I run a music store in the 80s. Woo, woo. Oh, what you got for me? This. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know what that is. And he goes, oh, if you've seen one, you've seen him. He goes, whoa, 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 let me check it out. And then uh, they start playing around with it, pressing some buttons, and the lights come out of it. And while this is going on, loads of police cars and fire engines are whizzing by outside. And Charlie says, whoa, it's like World War Three out there. Let's check it out. It's like Goonies. It is. It's like the opening of Goonies, isn't it's it? Very, must be a very small and quiet town for him to be like, oh, my God, because I... The odd time, it, it would happen in here in my little village. The odd, you know, emergency services or whatever. I'd, I'd, love, to see, I'd love to see Gwildor squish his milkshake up against the window as he's watching yeah. them all go by. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he picks up his police scanner, because he's obviously got one of those. Everybody had those in the 80s. And uh, he, he hears that there's been an incident at the high school, and Kevin says, oh my God. Julie, I left Julie at the high school. So he runs back to find out what's going on. He-Man, meanwhile, is telling Julie, we're looking for this thing called the Cosmic Key. He says to her... She's going, wake up, wake up. He actually says to her, it's about this big. Have you seen it? And if you just cut that bit out of the film, it could be a porno at that point, because he's wearing nothing, and he's saying to this woman, it's about this big, have you seen it? With with a porn director, porn (laughs) acted style no but i'd like to uh yeah um but she says oh i think i know the thing you're looking for does it have lights that come out of it and he says yes she goes yeah my boyfriend's got it oh he's and then he says another coincidence then he says we must go to him he could be in great danger (laughs) 
so good, so dry. But what, why? Why did I don't understand why he didn't try a bit more anyway? I know it's going to be changed, but like you can still tell delivery without sound. I don't think he really knew how to do it. I don't. I think it's that it comes to the direction. Yeah, the director should have said to him, "Try it with a bit more yeah. emotion." I you reckon know. it's probably too much on his plate. <clears throat> the director had probably a face, d- face I don't, in the plate. Okay. Probably didn't even fucking give him a time of day about his like his character and how he should he, deliver it. He was cast. He had for so his much project. to do. You imagine directing <clears throat> a movie that size with like the, the situation of the canon and the budget and dropping. Yeah, you've constantly got the producers showing up, screaming at you. Stressed as shit. You probably ain't got time. Just fucking do the thing. Great, out go. Keep and you've got you've got the pressure of you know this this was Fuck making that. billions what, what every happened? year as a toy line. What happened to the director? Um, well, other than the underage allegations, he didn't really do an awful lot after this. He did a few things, but not a lot. Gary Goddard. Okay. Um, but yeah, so um, back at the high school, Kevin goes back there. And there's a huge crime scene. Are you looking up Gary Goddard? I am, yes. Tell us. Let's let's take a little break. Um oh, I don't know what to tell you really, I'm just I'm just having a quick look. Okay. The reason I'm pausing is because we're about to meet Detective Lubick. Yeah, uh yeah, no, go for it. Uh the bald guy, who who is he? He is um, James Tolkien, who is also in Back to the Future. He plays Lubick in this. Oh, yeah, of course he is, yeah. <clears throat> so back at the high school, Kevin's gone back there. There's there's a huge fire that's been put out. The janitor has been put in a hospital. Um, he says, what happened? He goes, you don't want to know what happened here. Just, yeah, it does. Pretty, pretty fair. And then suddenly he meets Lubick and he goes, whoa, whoa. Now listen, kid, he's a real ball breaker. You get it straight away. He goes... What's your name and what do you want? And he goes, well, my name's Kevin and I'm looking for my girlfriend, Judy. And he goes, okay, well, we've got Grand Arson, all this. He starts listing all this stuff. And he goes, why don't you come with me? And he goes, what, I'm under arrest? He goes, no, but we're going to go find your girlfriend in my police car. And he grabs Kevin and takes him off in the police car. And they go and search for Judy. I guess that's what cops do. I guess. It's, it seems a really weird thing. Like, there's a scene of destruction that's happened and you go... What? Where's your girlfriend? I don't know. Right, let's go find her. It, you'd be like, you'd be like, detective. Should you not be to stay here on the scene of crime? What's happened? Like, where are you going? He's looking for his girlfriend. So what's that to do with you? Just we're just gonna go look for his girlfriend. Off we go. But he's a ball breaker, and he? he like he likes it. So. It is a bit weird. Maybe he's got other intentions. Well. Wildor has a new car in the next scene. He's got the Isaac Hayes mobile from uh, Escape from New York here. Yeah. He's pretty, pretty much got a pimped out caddy yeah. that he's stolen and he's put the flux capacitor from Back to the Future in it. And it's just this crazy high speed futuristic Cadillac that he's converted. They all get in and they go for a ride in Gwildor's pimp mobile. Incredible. Um, Skeletor and Evil Inn sort of flirt a little bit. Um, back in Castle Grayskull, the baddies come home, and it's that typical thing of, what happened? Oh, you should have seen the guys. There were like 20 guys, and they beat the shit out of us. But they go, all right, well, we'll find out what happened. It was just one guy. Um, Skeletor was pretty pissed off, and he kills one of his own men. He does. He evaporates Sorod. Saw Rod. Saw Rod. Oh my god, I've never got that until now. Saw Rod. What's he called? Saw Rod. Saw Rod. S A U R O D. Saw Rod. The action figure, when you spun the button on his back, sparks came out of his mouth. He's got Saw Rod. That's probably why the sparks were coming out of his mouth. So yeah, he kills Saw Rod and he says to Evil Inn, If you think you're so good, you go in his place. And he sends Evil Inn and the rest of the mercenaries and the troops back to Earth yep. to finish the job. So Evil Inn's like, fucked. She's like, oh, for Christ's sake. I don't really want to go on this mission, but I'm going to anyway. So they go and get the key. Um, Kevin and Detective Lubick arrive at Julie's house. And then she's not home. She's oh. not here. And he starts getting more and more suspicious of Kevin. The phone rings and it's Julie. And he pretends to her that 
you know, oh, you've got the wrong number. Yes, that's fine. I understand. And he's like, who's on the phone? Is that Julie? Takes the phone off her, but she's hung up. And then he says, well, I'm going to take this. Something doesn't add up here, and I don't know what the hell this thing is that you've got, but I'm going to take this um, as evidence, and I'm going to get it checked out. And if it is what you say it is, you can have it back. But the fact you found it in a crater in the ground is all a bit weird. And if somebody's reported it's stolen you're going to be in a lot of trouble. So I'm going to take this weird bomb thing with lots of flashing lights on it, and uh, I'm going to leave you in the house. Um, meanwhile, the troops in Evil Inn scan the junkyard, and they realise that Beastman and those guys were full of shit, and when they've got this, like, they've got this cool device that can show you the past, she sort of scans it around, and it, all it shows is just He-Man taking them all out and she's like I thought you said there was a whole army it was just He-Man yeah but, but he is the most powerful man in the universe at the same time yeah so don't be too pissed um Kevin uses the microwave which jams the signal for the cosmic key so they explode the microwave for the baddies no gremlin in it no not this time so Lou Big leaves Kevin like I say and this is where Beast Man etc show up at Julie's house where Kevin is they beat him up a little bit and then Evil Inn puts the collar on him yes I think it's called the Eldritch Collar I'm not sure if that's right um, but, but what this thing does is it clips around your neck and it makes you tell the truth in a robotic sort of voice it's a pretty cool device and they ask him you know it's a shame they can't use that in court just pop that one round his neck. To anybody who's on, on trial. Did you murder... Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I also killed a cat when I was three. All right, that's enough now. I sometimes wanked porn. The ch no, I don't want to know anymore. I'm really into bestiality. Get... Stop, take the collar off. He's telling us too much. It would be a bit much. It would be good, though. Yeah. I worry about that kind of thing. If I ever got hypnotised, what if I say too much? Yeah. I not that I've done anything bad. I have to do it live on the podcast. Not, of, not that I've ever... Have you ever been hypnotised? Um, uh, yeah, uh, um, I don't know. A couple of times, not really. It's been done to me in a proper environment. Um, uh, first what, time... by I, like a therapist or something? Yeah, yeah. First time I thought uh, I, I could see... I thought I rose from my chair and I saw it down, but I don't know. And the second time, no. My mind's too fucking... Whew, you're not getting me. I kind of would like to be hypnotised, but at the same time, I wouldn't. Do you know what I mean? It might be different now. My mum's... My mum? My mind's a lot calmer since my mushroom powder. Still going. Yeah. Still going. Still going on the lines, mate. It's good. It's good. It's working well, actually. There we go. So, yes, this collar uh, makes him re reveal okay. everything. No anxiety. Still not had bit, one bit of anxiety since it started working. Even with the Dolph Lundgren double bill looming. Yeah. <laughs> No, you weren't anxious at all. No, not one bit of anxiety. It's really weird. Do you think the man that broke into Brandon Lee's house had anxiety when Brandon walked into the bedroom? I think the realisation was anxiety <laughs> fueled. Yeah, nightmare fuel. Still love to see that. Yeah, but come on though. How how good's that? He's getting a few beers bought from him in the pub. When he gets out of hospital. How many times did he tell that story? John, tell him what happened when you tried to be a burglar. Whose house did you break into, well, it's a, you twat? It was first night burgling, wasn't it? And uh, it's fucking Brandon, you know, who's that? Bruce Lee's son. What? Bruce Lee, what that kung fu got you? Yeah. Is this like an Only Fools and Horses sketch? I don't know. You got him. Uh, I don't know why it is all of a sudden some weird England. Tr triggers there going, so I'm stood there with the, with the VCR in my arms and it walks Brandon Lee. <laughs> fucking hell. Yeah, it's quite funny. Uh, anyway, carry on. Sorry. So, yeah, uh, Kevin's told them everything because of the collar. So they now know that He-Man and Julie are together and the policeman's taking the key. Um, so that's what Skeletor and his troops are after. So they get in their flying spaceship craft, which looks quite good. It's not bad. You can see, you know, some of the... You can see where all the the effect or the budget has gone it's gone on like the special effects of the flying things and Skeletor's makeup and stuff like that yeah. it certainly hasn't gone on gone on Dolph Lundgren's acting lessons bless him um, 
Gwildor um, and everyone arrive at Julie's and they find Kevin tied up with the collar on his neck. And he says it was a woman with strange eyes. And they're like, oh, it must have been Evil Lynn. Yeah, yeah OK, let's get this collar off you. Um, and then Julie says, look, these guys are, don't worry, they all look fucking weird and they're all dressed in leather, sort of late, you know, what do you call it? Um, leather bondage gear. But these are all, don't worry, these are good guys. These uh, are and, good versions. And as he, man. He runs in like leather pants, Nothing. In... Robocop's dad, a woman in lycra, and a little fucking thing in drag. It's turns pervert. Up. <clears throat> Why does Gwildor show up in drag? He's, He's like, I found, he says, I found primitive clothing. Yeah, it's weird. We could disguise ourselves. And so they're like, okay, cool. So um, the cop goes to Charlie's music store. So we're back at the music store, Gav. You're right. You know. No. We're back here again. Um, <laughs> and meanwhile, and at Charlie's, um, Lubick says, uh, oh, because he's talking to Charlie about this device, this uh, cosmic key, and He-Man shows up. So he sees this like huge tall guy in the pants that we talked about, Robocop's dad, etc. And he says, well, I guess the circus is in town today. <laughs> Uh, he's quite a in. good detective he's quite well cast for it they're like we need that we need that back now um, and he's like no I'm not giving this to any in fact who are you guys I think we're all going to go downtown for a walk Tila pulls a gun on Lubick and he's like you guys are in trouble they disarm the detective and then Guildo says someone's coming because the key's making a flashing sound so Man at Arms and Tila say all the humans go and hide in the back of the shop We'll defend us, defend ourselves from what's about to happen, and what's about to happen is a huge laser gunfight taking place in the uh, a big laser store. fight in the music music store. Yep, and all the, all the guitars and keyboards are catching on fire and exploding. Uh, Tila gets a chance to say she shoots a few people and she goes, huh, "Woman at arms," which I've always loved that line. I yeah, thought that was a yeah. good line. Fair enough. Um, Lou bit can't believe what's going on, and Kevin and Julia saying to him, "This is real." Like, forget all your big balls and everything. This is actually war, intergalactic war that's happening. So just fucking shut up, Blue Big. Meanwhile, Julie hears a noise from the back of the alley out the back of the shop. Julie. And she looks out and it's her mum. Her mum's alive. She's not dead. It's her mum. This bit got me. I don't know why this time around maybe I don't, you know the things that I've been through in the last five years but she goes out there and her mum says it's alright we're not really dead we were involved in a secret government conspiracy we've had to change our identities now all we need as part of the project we're working on is a special thing called the cosmic key go and get it for us so Julie runs in she snatches the cosmic key out while they're all arguing takes it out the woman hugs her and she goes oh mum I've missed you so much and her mum turns into evil Lynn the cow what a bitch and then Judy is devastated. She falls to the floor crying. Uh, more laser battles. The baddies escape. The heroes chase them. Lubick grabs a shotgun. End scene. <laughs> End scene. Evil Lynn sends a signal to, to Skeletor saying, we've got the portal. We've got the key. It's time to open the portal. Come on through. So a giant portal arrives and an army of Skeletor's troopers arrive with him. flying surfboards. Yeah, and he's got a big throne that sort of floats through the, across the ground, doesn't he? Yeah. He um, man gets gets one, doesn't he? Yeah, well they all climb up to the roof. Um he takes out a few of the troops and he grabs one of their hoverboards, doesn't he? Yeah, it looks pretty ridiculous, but yeah. It doesn't look good, does it? No. It looks like one of the He Man toys because it doesn't move. Yeah. It's just sort of flying upside down and around, but nothing's going on. But we get a moment where he mans sort of taking out these guys in midair with his sword. Um, and Skeletor sneaks up behind everybody else in his flying throne. And um, he makes them surrender their weapons. Um, he man says, if I come with you, will you let the rest of them go? Typical thing. And he's like, yeah, 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 sure, he man. <laughs> of course. Like he man, like Skeletor is going to really keep his word. Um, Judy gets shot in the leg by Skeletor's lightning out of his fingertips. Copyright Star Wars. And uh, he says to He-Man, this is quite a, a sexual moment, he says, you're going to come back to Eternia as my slave and be whipped. Yeah. So He-Man's like, all right, cool. Of course he is. 
he does whatever he's told, isn't he? So, is he a sub, is he? I guess. Nice. So, they leave. They take He-Man with them back to Castle Grayskull. Leaving the humans, Julie's got a very fucked up leg with green shit all over it. Um, Lubig tries to get some backup, but the other cops think he's nuts when they, he tells them about the swords and lasers and stuff like that. And, go on. What? Oh, I thought you were going to say something there. No. Um, they they tell Julie that only the sorceress can heal you. So now the t- the clock is really ticking because not only is Skeletor going to win if they can't get everyone back to Council Grayskull, but Julie's going to die as well. Because the Casio keyboard comes to save the day. Thank fuck. Thank fuck. The Casio he's the keyboard player. And it's yep. just a, yeah. Well, Gwildor says the only th- if I can just work out the tones, and he's like, "What do you mean tones?" And he's like, "It's like a." And he goes, oh, do you mean this? And he just goes, do, 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 do. And he hums. And Gwildor's like, how did you do that? What, how did I hum? That you have fucking humming and tunes and singing and whistles on your planet. And he goes, look, I'll get those, oh, let me go and get a keyboard from Charlie's burnt down shop. The last one, probably, that hasn't melted. I guess. He brings it back and um, they start working out the tones, don't they? so that they can reopen the portal. Charlie's, hey. at, Charlie's at his music shop just crying because his music store is just destroyed. His whole life. And insurance are going to be like, act of God. And he says to Lubig, grab that shotgun. You can go out and go for it if you want. Now, He-Man is naked at this point. He's been stripped down to his pants. Fucking hell. In front of Skeletor. Oh, look at me. Do you like my pants? Look You're safe my, now. My and Skeletor says, I win, He-Man. I win. The, the sorceress is almost drained. I've got your sword. Oh, finally, I'm holding your sword, He-Man. And he says, Blade, come in here and whip him. So he's like the gimp. So he brings in the Blade, the gimp. Yeah. He's, he's got not just got a whip, he's got an electric whip, Gav. I've got He-Man's all gone a bit homoerotic here. It has. This happened in um, Flash Gordon as well. There was some whipping and stuff going on on that as well. Yeah. They're both in the and same it, uh, wheelhouse, both, aren't they? they were, and they were both wearing leather pants as well. Are uh, they both canon as well? Uh, no, um, Flash Gordon isn't canon, but it felt like a canon film. Yeah. And we mean that in a very good way, of course. Um, so yeah, He-Man is whipped and chained, my notes say, weirdly. Blade seems to be loving it. He's like licking his lips as he's whipping him. <laughs> Um, and um, he says, when the sun's coming up, and as you die, He-Man, I'll be reborn. Um, so that's what's kind of happening in Castle Grayskull. Lubig and the cops creep up on Kevin, um, and then they open a portal to Castle Grayskull, which sucks in all the good guys, Lubig the cop, and half a car. Uh, which is quite a cool effect that half a car is kind of there in Castle Grayskull. Yeah. Um, Beastman and Evil Inn are going to be traitors and sneak away. Um, and the goodies will start to win the battle. It's basically now, this is where the budget runs out. Yeah, it's just the same again, the, isn't it? The interesting thing is, though, this set at the time was the most expensive set ever built in a film. This Castle Grayskull set, but so that's another reason why they they spent all their money on this set. But it doesn't look very good. It doesn't really, it's does not it? Short well, no. You need more of an exterior of the whole actual castle, and it needs is I have the power, and just so much more cool stuff. He does do mm. that, but it's like it's too late, too late. Well, he man escapes from the chains. Um, they all fight. The bodies. He Man pushes a huge statue over, showing that he's got that super strength, which sort of ends the battle pretty much. Lou Big gets annoyed. Nobody takes bad shots at Lou Big and starts firing his gun at people, realizing, you know, God, this is real. I mean, uh, in a Star Wars film, but not. Yeah. <laughs> um, and Skeletor turns into God Skeletor. He says, I am a god. And he's got this weird giant gold armor on. And him and He-Man have this giant battle, um, which, again, there was no budget for this. So there's no backgrounds. It's all shot in a dark room. Um, the only effects were like sparks coming off their weapons and the odd little sort of bit of magic flying up in the air. He-Man defeats him. Skeletor turns back into Skeletor. 
Uh, and then He-Man um, holds up the sword and says, Oh! oh, 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 oh. And like, I'm like, What did that earlier? I love that bit. That bit gives me goosebumps he every could have time. Done that a f- three times. I'd allowed it three times in the movie. So, do you want to know a secret? Well, I was going to say that end battle was so lackluster. It's such a shame. This is a personal thing, but I got teary this time around when he said, I have the power. I don't know why. I I can't tell you why. This film just brings me so much joy that I got tears in my eyes this time when Dolph Lundgren shouted, I have the power. And he didn't even say it in a very good, clear voice, but it was enough for me. (laughs) I'm the (laughs) boy! Uh, should we do another take? No, that's fine. We're running out of money. Right, let's go move. They've just taken the cameras, so no, we can't. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren. Someone's oh, taking his, okay. his shoes off while he's still acting. Um, it's a shame I don't think this movie was given, uh, given the movie it should have had. No, it should have been made a couple of years earlier, maybe. And it should have been made <laughs> with a proper studio and done properly. And it, this would have been like, whoa, man. Um, imagine if Lucas' film, you know... There's so many things. Or John do... Carpenter, like I said. There's so many yeah. things. Well, we get another Star Wars rip-off now because He-Man eventually wins. He knocks Skeletor off and he falls, just like the Emperor, falls down at the end of Return of the Jedi uh, into a pit. They seem to have won. Lubig, Detective Lubig decides he's going to stay because he's now the king. What if, what if David Lynch had done it? Like the little fella's back was talking and shit. What if David Cronenberg had done it? Jesus. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> or Argento. No, that, that's going too far. Um, the only person I think could have done this uh, in later years, and a lot of people wanted him to do it, was Peter Jackson. After the Lord of the Rings movies, they said he'd be the perfect director to make a serious He-Man movie or trilogy of movies. I don't know. Because they did it. With, he did so well with Lord of the Rings. I say Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, that would be a good shout as well. Yeah. Uh, well. Uh, Skeletor falls into a pit. Um, Lubig becomes king of Cascarius. Come and says, I'm not going back to Earth. I've got everything I ever want here. I've got a beautiful woman feeding me grapes. I live in a castle. So he's happy. Um, Kevin and Judy say, well, we've got to go back. So Gwildor says, I'll send you back to your home planet and your home time. And um, he says, good journey. They all say, good journey. They all hug. And when she wakes up, she's wearing a fucking Victorian night dressing gown. What is going on with this? This is my biggest fault of the film. Not the acting or the effects or the budget. It's what the fuck Courtney Cox wears to bed as a girl in 1987. Does not wear a Victorian night gown like that. It's really weird. It's just like someone's so out of touch. Anyway, she wakes up and realises Gwildor has sent her it back to It was all her... of a dream! <laughs> well, no, it wasn't, but um, I, wish, I bet she wishes it was. Um, she, well, she thinks it was a dream, doesn't she? Because her parents are still alive. She steals the plane keys. Thank she says, please don't fly today. She runs out in the street yeah, in yeah, her yeah. weird night gang. Kevin's there. And he's like, I remember it too. She's like, oh my God, it wasn't a dream after all. Uh, maybe it was a... A thank you from Gwildor, which it was and then they look into the little ball of energy that they've given them as a gift and inside you can see a little tiny He-Man who says I love the power uh, and then the credits roll and then after the credits gap you probably didn't see it did you? No. One of the very first ever after credit scenes and an indication that they thought they were going to get a sequel Skeletor pops up out of the water and says I'll be back and yet he never was and I didn't know about that and I owned this as a kid on VHS it's after about five years of owning it one day I let the credits play on I came back in the room and that scene happened and I thought what the fuck because back then you didn't watch all the credits Alice Alice <laughs> no this I'm talking like it's about 30 years ago I realised oh, okay. it was there but um yeah He-Man the Masters of the Universe He-Man well, um, yeah, I'm I'm glad we did it for you. We're very excited for it, and I know you like Masters of the Universe. Um, you've got a tattoo, haven't you? Uh, I've got a couple. I've got Battle Cat, and I've got the He-Man Sword as well. Hmm. Um, so I'm glad we could do that for you for your birthdays. That's the main thing. Um, I, I thought, yeah, 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 that's all right. 
I, I probably wouldn't watch it again. No offense. So as your as a child, you weren't like. It's... I wasn't into it as a child as well. I remember it's really weird. I remember being like, oh, and slightly disappointed, and not really wanting to revisit. I think. Fair enough. I might have done, but I just, yeah, it wasn't. I don't know. Like I think exactly like you said, hit too late. I was not bothered at that point. It really did. Everybody in this suffered. All the costumes were so heavy that they could barely move. The sword Apart was from a real sword. Dolph Lundgren. But he had to carry a sword which he could barely lift, even with his strength. So he had to learn how to use a broadsword for this, um, which is pretty crazy. Um, yeah, and they'd been trying to get this movie made for about four years. So they should have really tried harder, because if they, like we said, if they'd made it earlier, it was fine, but it didn't work. Um, and yeah, it was the biggest Hollywood set in 40 years at that time when they made it. Um, and they never did get to make Spider-Man, directed by uh, James Cameron, which is weird. Imagine the universe where this film did really well and then Superman did really well and they made Spider-Man and James Cameron's first proper film after Piranha 2 that would be weird was Spider-Man pretty pretty weird but yeah look at the end of the day everybody knows that this film flopped big time but it's one of those ones that people kind of forgive over years because because of He-Man because of those childhood memories and as a grown up this is a a badly made Star Wars ripoff, trying to cash in on a toy line that had gone way past its sell by date. No one, the cartoon wasn't even probably on TV much anymore at this point. But as it, as the five year old Dan who loved He Man, or the nine year old Dan that would have been when this came out, I still love this. Um, and it's silly and it's nonsensical, but I can really see Frank uh, Langella is having a blast with it and. I've got to give this a thumbs up. You're going to probably not give it a thumbs up. <laughs> no, no, I don't give it a thumbs up. Sorry. A couple of interesting facts about this. Very quickly before we wrap up the show. Um, there was a contest run by the um, Mattel Toys. And the, you had to design a character. And if you won the competition, not only would they make your toy of your character, but you'd get a role in the film. Oh, and this, someone did, didn't they? And I a boy called R Richard Sponder did it, and he became, he was Pig Boy. Nice. Just wears a pig's mask. Amazing. In it for about three seconds. But he told all his mates, when he, oh, he's in the He-Man film. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And apparently in some early drafts, um, She-Ra was going to be in it as well. I wonder who that would have been. Yeah. Who would have played her? Grace, Probably, uh, Grace Jones. No, it would have been um, Bridget Wilson. Yeah, that's Bridget the Wilson. only person, isn't it, really? Yeah, um, it's got to be. All right, and, well, that's cool. Let's, uh, let's wrap this up. Let's wrap this up. Well, thank you, for, first of all, before yeah, we do. No thank problem. you for that. Yeah, uh, yeah outro time. Let's do it. And we're back again. Back again to say... Goodbye. Au revoir. Goodbye. Sayonara. Thank you for Be indulging me, uh, Gavin, and all of our listeners on my birthday episode. Uh, I love talking about He-Man. I love talking about Dolph Lundgren. And, yeah, it's just been a fantastic way to spend my birthday episode. So, yes, thank you for indulging me. Yee! I had a lot of fun. But Good. Dark Angel was definitely the better of the two films. Uh, yeah, Dark Angel was kind of quite fun actually. Mm -hmm. uh, the there ending, uh, you kind of forget the ending, but the rest of it's pretty good. But Gavin, my friend, mm. what's coming up next? Do you want to know? Yeah, of course. Well, that was at episode 154. So mm, our next episode is a director special. Episode 155 will be looking at Andre Overdahl. Oh yeah. Uh, and we'll be reviewing his two movies, Troll Hunter from 2010 and The Autopsy of Jane Doe from 2016. So that's going to be pretty spooky and back to some proper horror for that one as well. And uh, one of them's a found footage, essentially. Yeah, yeah, which is Style, cool. you know. So we'll have a blast with that one. After that, 
it's a patron big 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 and i have some head breaking news for you gav some headlines so our patron dante has given me the picks that he wants us to cover amazing so we've got one old and one new okay i'm really excited for this and he was really really scratching his head over which he, he gave me a list of four or five films he was definitely he wanted to do the new one which is a 2017 movie called Cult, c-a-u-g-h-t which okay. i've never heard of right. he said he said he found it by accident on prime um Court says it's a story of a journalist couple who invite a man and woman into their idyllic village home but what begins with an informal interview descends into a nightmarish fight for survival i wonder if it's kind of like funny games or something like that yeah it could be Mm. i'm not gonna i'm not gonna do any research i won't either i'll go into it nice cool and then and then he said i want to do an old film to go with that one so he gave me a few and i was like yeah i love all of those we've not covered any of them but eventually he settled on 1962 oh wow what country first of all see if i can guess it oh okay no i won't be able to guess it uh not of living dead no no but it is black and white okay carnival of souls oh okay i'm a big fan of this one yeah um so that's going to be really cool and i've actually that's been on our list for a long time and i've been figuring out how we would be able to talk about that one but this is how we're going to be reviewing it up for our episode cool. for dante All so right. carnival of souls 62 and uh cult from 2017 exciting after that kicking off the summer episode 157 yep friday the 13th part four the final chapter <laughs> followed by a new beginning i love the way that those two are titled uh, it's uh, jason a good combo four, yeah. jason four and jason five excellent Can't wait. made in made in 84 and 85 back to back brilliant that's how, that's how they did it back then um so that's our next three episodes and if you want to know what episode 158 is going to be then I'll tell you now, because I've got it in front of me. And it's a Wes Craven director's special. <laughs> oh, wow. We're giving you the gifts here, guys. Four, um, four we... episodes ahead you're giving us. I know. Well, I had it written down, so I thought I'd read it out. Um, we picked one each many, many moons ago, Gav. You might not remember this, but right. you did tell me that you wanted to cover The Hills Have Eyes from 1977. So I said... Well, I didn't say that. That must have been a long time ago, because I got rid of my DVD years ago, because I was like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're covering The Hills Have Eyes from 1977. Interesting movie to talk about, though. There's a sure. lot, lot of just the time and stuff. Yeah, movie making at the time. Yeah. And yeah, cool. we're going to be pairing it up with a 1991 film, The People Under the Stairs. Okay, interesting. So, two weird Yeah, films no, I think uh, Hills Have Eyes would be a really good conversation, actually. It's quite dark. It's, it's, to actually. be honest, it's a, I don't mind the film at all, um, and I think I watched it quite a lot years ago in my youth. Uh, so I kind of just been like, uh, do you know what I mean? Um, but going back as a reviewer, probably quite fun. Yeah, it'd be given well, an that... excuse to watch it, I suppose. Really, because I don't really. It's not really something I could go for very often. So yeah. Well, there's your next four episodes, you lucky lot. Um, but yeah, the next one is going to be Andre Overdose. Troll Hunter and the Autopsy of Jane Doe. Amazing. So thank you everybody for bearing with us for our Dolph Lundgren birthday bash. Birthday bash off. Well, before we say our goodbye, should I do some housekeeping? You should indeed. Thank you all for listening and supporting and sharing and liking and being our friends, whether in real life or in real life because the internet is real as well. Um, we have been the podcast on Haunted Hill. As always, for the last 10 years, we are a proud member of Legion Podcast Network. Uh, you can find out more about Legion Podcast if you go to legionpodcast.com. That's where we and all of our old shows are, as well as all the other shows under the Legion Network. We're also a proud member of Deadbolt Media. Talk more about that in a moment. Love saying that now. Sounds so cool. Sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Deadbolt Media. Deadbolt Media. Oh, hello. Um, you can find out more about us if you go to Facebook. We've got a page on there, 
podcast on Hunted Hill. Legion also has a page on there, just Legion Podcasts. Um, and yeah, join our podcast page, chat to us. We're very friendly. You can private message us. You can email us directly at the podcast on Haunted Hill Outlook dot com if you want to suggest or things or question or you know tell us we're shit, whatever it might be. Tell us why Dolph Lundgren is the best actor in the world, or whether Steven Seagal really does have the highest IQ in the world. Or if you had read a costume Dolph wore in He Man, and send it to me, send me the pictures. Um, wherever you're listening to us now is where you can continue to listen to us. We're on most um, podcast platforms, Spotify, YouTube, Podknife, Apple, etc., etc. And we're on Instagram. It's the podcast on Haunted Hill Insta. I mentioned um, Deadbolt Media. If you go to deadboltfilms.com, that is our production company yep. website um, where you can find out more about our short films, our features, um, our other podcasts that Gav does. Hi, Strangers Podcast with Sarah. Um, Yes, you discuss true crime and Spookiness. strange and weird. We've got a serial killer coming up uh, around the world. Yeah, very soon. Um, and yes, we also do comics as well. And uh, Deadbolt Films is on Instagram, just under um, Deadbolt Films. And finally, we're also a patron. So if you want to support the show financially and help us continue to grow and move forward as a show then you can do so for as little as a pound a month you be- you could become a patron supporter or a dollar um if you become a get a t-shirt you get a t- free t-shirt sent to you anywhere in the world um and you also get to pick your two picks for your patron pick we are trying to do it in rotation in the same order every time um everybody's coming up to their second round now so you'll get to pick the two movies we review and tell us why you want us to review them what you love about them what you don't give us your own mini review and critique of them um you also have exclusive access to all of our back catalog we're releasing one episode every friday um exclusively on patreon on our freaky friday um and you we sometimes put um, additional content bonus content on there as well uh we also give early access to a lot of our episodes on there a few days before they actually come out normally so it's worth doing um if you want to do that go to patreon and just search for the podcast on haunted hill if you can't find it then again the email is the podcast on haunted hill outlook.com or you can message me directly on facebook i'll and buy that for a dollar i buy that for a dollar and as always our patrons will get their names right out. not i'm not going to do a dolph Lundgren voice that's mean to dolph because he's got a huge iq iq i said um so instead, I'm just going to thank all of our patrons by name. So thank you ever so much to Dante, to Don Collier, Matthew Godley, Jamie Jenkins, Kevin S. Fife, Sarah Kay, Rachel, RJ McCready, and Lex Boo. Thank you so, 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 so much. Yes, we always say we would do this without any support, but the fact that you guys are willing to help Makes us it out... Special. It does indeed. Uh, but thank you to you, all of you guys, and thank you to everybody, as always, who listens, shares, likes, and generally just supports the show. We love you all very much. I'm going to take my birthday hat off now, put my birthday suit on. Oh. oh. And it's time for us to say good night and goodbye. So it's a good night from... The oh, I was going to do that one. Oh, sorry, you do it then. No, 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 yeah, no, no, it's already done now. I don't know who else is good night from, really. Weird aliens. They come down with CDs as weapons. Uh, well, if that movie was made in the 70s, they'd be using vinyl. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I wouldn't want to get hit by a vinyl. It'd be like Shaun of the Dead. What's it now? A USB stick? That's not going to do much, is it? Nah. Hit him with a Spotify gun. Uh, it's, uh, a, it's a good night from uh, 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 Robocop's dad. And it's a good night from Gwildor. I'm going to flood you with my gills. Oh, you're going to get undressed. I'll look through the window. Hmm. Hey, man. Nice pants. Well, that's it, I guess. Thanks, listeners, for listening and taking care of yourselves. No, you worded that completely wrong. <laughs> I worded that like you were masturbating while again? listening to us. <laughs> What I will say, guys, is I will leave you with two inspirational phrases yeah, from He Man. Wrong. First of all, I will say, don't forget, you all have the power. And secondly, good journey. <laughs> <laughs>